dress to go out huh yeah so parak shall i open the session today uh, sorry shall i be shall i open the session today? yeah Please. yeah i open the huh? session my internet is a little unstable today no problem so definitely yeah i'll open the session and introduce both the speakers and then we'll go ahead okay. you have some slides set up yeah i've got about just uh, three slides for introduction that's it okay. so ashok i'll just share the screen now so that uh, yes. it's better that we have the uh, you know the first thing showing Sure. And you let us know Ashok when to go live, okay? <clears throat> We can go ahead now. All set? Yes. Okay. A uh, very good evening to all of you and good afternoon based on which part of the world you're tuning in from and it's a great pleasure to have you all back with us for this uh, 10th PKC webinar series. So we have uh, two excellent faculty today who are internationally renowned in the field of knee surgery and we've specifically chosen this topic of osteotomies around the knee. The two guests that speakers that we introduce today are masters in the field of osteotomy. They have pioneered several path making techniques. They also essentially have taken osteotomy and knee preservation to a completely new level across the globe. which means that we can help our patients a lot more better it's my great privilege to uh, to introduce and to welcome these two great speakers and uh, we going to be uh, starting we going to be having couple of uh, very interesting talks today the talks essentially are going to be based on this uh, uh, osteotomy and what we have today is uh, dr professor adrian wilson from london i'm just going to try and to get the slides move ashok can you help me get the slides move please i can't uh... Uh, just tap on the slide sir it will start moving and, and then press the head i'm unfortunately i can't do that so maybe if you unshare the screen and you can do it from your end yeah sure be nice yeah because uh, somehow my screen has got stuck somewhere Can you see, sir? No, I can't. I can't. Sachin. Yes. Just, just click on the slide two times, and you know. Uh, I think Parag, I'll ask you to introduce the speakers because I think I'm having some issues on my end. So I'm yeah. going to be logging out and logging back in. So please go ahead with the presentation, please. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so we'll just I think both of them are having internet problems. Quite some issues. I don't know if if uh, one can hear our voice. Adrian? Yeah, we can hear you clearly. Okay, so I uh, no, if, if, if all the audience hears our voices, I guess we we should not uh, really lose too much so, time uh, because we we'll uh, get Shuk, some precious. Shuk, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, sir. So let's start with the talk, Christian. Perfect. This is what I wanted to say. Yeah. Yes, I think let's let's start with the first talk, and I'm sure by then the connectivity would be better. So okay, let's, welcome all the let's, viewers, and over to Dr. Christian K for his talk. Perfect. So I sh I start sharing my desktop then. Yes. And uh, so first, attend. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to uh, to speak um, in front of such a 
crowd, um, though not uh, physically there, but virtually such an uh, amazing opportunity, really. Um, now it's switched back to uh, some other screen, I guess. So I don't see my desktop anymore. You just have to put share your screen. Yeah, I did. Yeah, so that should be there. The... Do you see my screen now? How to plan osteotomy around the knee? No, no. not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Sorry. Okay, so I have my screen as a screen share right now. Yeah, just a minute. So, Sachin, your screen is on. Just see if you can advance, Sachin. I think Sachin sir's uh, laptop was hanged because of his issue, and uh, that's the reason why. Now he's logged in again. Yeah. Sachin, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. so you want to log out, Sachin? Now uh, Christian will put up his presentation. Your slide okay. is being seen. Okay, I'll just do that. I'll you just, just leave stop it. sharing. Yeah. So just yeah. tell me when okay. you see my screen. Yeah, now yeah, we can see your screen, screen, Christian. Perfect. So once again, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to share this uh, with such a, a great crowd of orthopedic surgeons. Topic today is uh, osteotomy about the knee. And um, Adrian and I, we are really happy to be invited to uh, to give these lectures here. So the first one is uh, is on planning. Second one will be on HDO and all the novelties uh, that are around. Third one will be on distal femoral osteotomy and then rather uh, the finalizing thing puts it all together uh, in okay. double level osteotomy lecture. So I start off with the first one um, to show you what we first at hand need. Well, we need a smart surgeon obviously, but you can easily detect this is not a surgeon um, because uh, this is not of a, a surgeon's tool. So uh, this rather looks more like a normal surgeon and uh, unfortunately, today, we are not here where we are all supposed to be due to our friend, this little coronavirus, but that gives us the chance uh, to uh, give online presentation. So this is where we are linked to right now. This is our work desk. And uh, I put on my work desk a couple of things that we need now for osteotomy planning. And uh, well, unfortunately, osteotomy planning is never associated with the OR directly. It's something that happens before it then, because you need to have a plan in order to be equipped when you attend the surgery and you, uh, and you have to plan it uh, prior. So what you need uh, for planning is obviously an X-ray. So let's just press on that X-ray and, oh, that was uh, actually not the X-ray that we pressed on. So let's go one step back. Let's take the X-ray and press on that one. Perfect. So what you need in terms of an X-ray is a full extending AP. And that's already the first thing which might be controversial because it's tricky somewhat to access what is a full extending AP, straight AP. But anyhow, I will give you an idea on that in a second, but we need that. So how is it, uh, is it set up? Well. This is something of organization in between you and your radiologic department. You need to go sometimes to the radiographer to get things sorted and right. Anyhow, what you need is a standardized image and I will show you on how that looks. Obviously for our normal um, assessment, we also have knee AP and lateral. Um, we routinely take a patella skyline view and um, I personally take a Rosenberg, but it's really very useful to have either a Rosenberg or a stress uh, X-ray in order to get some certain information, what happens not uh, with the specific bones, so in so to say the femur and the tibia, but within them at the level of the joint, which is rather resembled by the joint line convergence angle. So um, MRI and Sinti, we, we can forget about that. Now, uh, as a matter of fact, there, are, there might be some questions answered uh, by these uh, imaging um, uh, uh, things, but is, is nothing that we need right now. So we are taught that for um, the AP orientation, uh, we need to point the patella forward. So this is obviously wrong, and this is rather right. But if you look at uh, the rest here, which is the proximal, um, which is the proximal uh, part of the um, uh, tip fib, the tibia fibula joint, plus the condyles that you cannot really see here. Uh, to me, it rather seems that as the patella is the most mobile bone amongst these, um, I always like to take a look 
at the proximal tip fit, as you can see here, obviously here as well, the patella is decentered. But you see what a tremendous change a correct AP standing X-ray makes in terms of overall limb alignment. So you really need to make sure that you see the proximal tip fib, so the head of the fibula, one third covered, and that you see uh, the patella pointing forward and the condyles need to look at you straight and not as a curve either to medial or lateral side. So that's very important. So, um, then let's go back to the very basics. So it was in 1878, quite a long time ago, that Johan Mikulic wrote his thesis. And he was the first one actually to identify that not only the whole leg axis or the long leg axis, the mechanical axis pointing from the center of the femoral head to the center of the ankle joint passes the knee somewhere close to the middle. As a matter of fact, uh, he never stated that this is the weight-bearing line. Uh, he said, and he called that Direktionslinie, which is direction line. And this line, in fact, passes somewhere close to the middle, slightly rather to the medial side where uh, the medial spine is, the tip of the medial spine. But he also found out that the joint line itself uh, points uh, obliquely to the medial side. So there is a, um, there is a, a joint line obliquity with a medial proximal tibia angle of 87 and a lateral distal femur angle of 87. This is what he found out as well. So why is that now? Because when you walk and run and jump and hike and uh, you medialize your foot and you place your foot under the center of, uh, of weight uh, in order to gain balance, then all of a sudden, whilst medializing your foot, you horizontalize this um, pseudo oblique joint line. So as a matter of fact, when it really counts, when you have four times your body weight on one foot, then it's really important to have an horizontal joint line. And in normal stance, where you have an oblique joint line, actually you place 50% of your body weight on each knee. So looking at that again, you can see that here, this is the normal stance axis, and there you have a joint line obliquity, MLDFA, mechanical lateral distal femur ankle, medial proximal tibia ankle, and when you zoom in and look for the close up and place, um, place uh, the ankle joint at the center to get some balance, then you automatically horizontalize your joint line orientation. So that's very important. And um, so it, it, was, it was out there for years, but actually no one really focused on uh, the joint line orientation but rather uh, the Mikulic line was of importance when planning an osteotomy. And nowadays we look more and more for anatomic circumstances to achieve normal biomechanics. So looking at these biomechanics, now we go uh, to the guy who gave us all the nomenclature of that. And that was Draw Paley in this masterpiece, Deformities of, osteotomy cor uh, of, of Deformity Correction. So, and he defied joint centers, joint lines and joint axes to describe the deformity, the overall deformity, as far as the bone and the joint level is concerned. So let's look for the center of the hip. That's quite simple. The center of the hip, uh, radiologically seen, you, uh, you just assess a square uh, um, and uh, a sphere. And this sphere obviously is a circle in a 2D projection. So the center of the circle is easy to be found. And this is the center of the proximal femur. Now looking at the center of the knee uh, at the distal femur and the proximal tibia, that becomes a little more complicated because you could choose the outer margin of the bone, you could choose the outer margin of the skin, the area in between the spines, um, whatever. But overall, you can see if you really have an AP image, then all these points are rather located centrally around one line. So in fact, it does not really matter which one you choose. I personally take uh, the roof of the notch and, the, uh, and for the tibia, um, the point in between the uh, medial and lateral spine, but anyhow, feel free, as you can see, to choose whatever you like. And for the ankle joint, I take the center of the talus. So now we define the proximal and the distal centers of uh, the femur and the tibia. The next thing would be to take a look at the joint lines. Well, looking now at the distal joint line of the femur, well, that's the connection of the medial and lateral condyle. And if you do this now for the tibia, it connects uh, the subchondral sclerosis of the proximal tibia. 
So now you have a joint line for the distal femur and the proximal tibia. Having that now, plus all the joint centers that you can connect, the last thing we take a look, this was the distal tibia, not too much of importance here for our uh, question right now. The next thing you need to take a look at is the axis. And there is anatomic axis and mechanical axis. And the anatomic axis is basically describing the anatomy and the mechanical axis describes the mechanic circumstances, which is at the tibia, somewhat the same, but at the femur, this is the anatomic axis of the femur and the tibia that you see here. Now, looking at uh, the mechanical axis, that connects the joint centers proximal and distally that we've just learned. And uh, therefore at the tibia, that is almost parallel and therefore it plays no role it, uh, on which one you might plan. Anyhow, we are talking about the mechanical axis. And uh, for the femur, there is a difference due to the femoral neck. And you always need to know that. So this is why we always indicate that we talk about the mechanical axis by stating MLDFA, mechanical lateral distal femur ankle. And we just say that for the femur because there it's of importance. For the tibia, as we learned, it's parallel. So you can leave that out. So the whole leg axis now, which is this um, Mikulic line, just gives you an overall idea whether you have a varus or a valgus alignment. And obviously uh, that's of importance to know uh, what, you, what you have and where you wanna go to. So uh, you, you have develop your plan based on that, but it's not an individualized approach. It doesn't give you any idea whether your malalignment is at the femur, at the tibia, or maybe at the level of the joint. So what it all now delivers you is this uh, nice value card. And uh, this is the nomenclature. And that's very important because you need to uh, know what you're talking about. As a matter of fact, uh, initially when you start with planning and looking at, at what Paley described there and Mikulic did 150 years ago, um, it's always quite, um, confusing and you it's it's hard to remember all these values but make it simple for yourself and just pretend that the Mikulic line passes the knee in the middle and is straight and the joint line has a two degree inclination to that so therefore you have an MLDFA of 88 and the MPTA of 88 and if you say it's three degrees then it might be 87 but anyhow you just defy the uh, the angles and name the ones that are below 90. So this is why it's MLDFA, lateral distal femur angle, and MPTA for medial proximal tibia angle. And the sequence is always like that. You just give information about mechanical or anatomical. In our case, it's always the M. Then you say medial or lateral. Then you say proximal or distal. And then you refer to the bone, femur or tibia. So. This is how it comes to MLDFA and MPTA. And these angles are always to be measured and very important. And as we said, we talk about the mechanical angles. Um, and it's really important now to have this individualized approach because all these melanignments can be either in the femur, it could be in the tibia, it could be in both, or it could be in none of them and just be in the joint at the joint line convergence angle. So if you don't have an individualized measurement and approach to that, you will never detect that just by looking at the hip, hip knee ankle angle or the Mikulic line. So that's very important to individualize it. Now let's take our goniometer and start with a normal planning. So the first thing you do when planning an osteotomy, and here we take the open wedge high tibial osteotomy because this is the workhorse and covers 80% of your cases. So in this basic talk, we should just refer to this one. So now it's quite simple to connect the center of the hip and the center of the ankle joint and find your Mikulic line. And that tells you now, okay, I have a various alignment. Now you want to transfer this into slight valgus and therefore, you draw a virtual Mikulic line intersecting the tibia at your chosen preference point or region. And we will come back to that uh, in a bit. So now having done that, I found it always difficult to imagine what to do next. So the next thing is quite simple. After actual Mikulic line and virtual Mikulic line, what you need is a hinge point. 
you just need a hinge point and this is what you defy. And the hinge point, um, well, I have also a slide on that one, how to find it. Let's just put it here. And now it's very, very simple when you just become the hinge. So make yourself the hinge and look at the whole thing as if you are the hinge. So now you zoom in, stand yourself and place yourself at the hinge point. And then you look at the actual point where your ankle joint is right now. And then you just turn your head to the right in this case and take a look where you want to be. And now this angle that the rotation of your head describes is the angle of your osteotomy. So drawing that now into our planning would be the line called A, which is your actual angle of sight when your head is the hinge. And then you turn your head and take a look where you want to be. And this describes a circle. It's a definitive radius. And this radius hits the virtual ankle, uh, Mikulic line. And this point actually then forms from the hinge your line B. So this is nothing else but the change of your, of your head and your sight whilst being the hinge. And this gives you the angle A. Angle A is now being transposed to the medial cortex because what you want during a surgery is not an angle. What you want is metrics because it's hard to measure and determine an angle during a surgery, but it's very, very easy to measure it. So you need metrics. And on the calibrated X-ray now, you can translate, so to say, this angle by just measuring um, the wedge base height, and then you're equipped with a wedge base height that you want to reproduce during the surgery. So it's as simple as that. The last thing is if we now go for the scissors, um, that's the very tricky part of it, uh, because obviously after measuring now everything, you might find out that the deformity is in the, in the femur, or you might find out that it's in the tibia. But it's very complex now if you find that there is some degree of malalignment within the joint, which is the joint line convergence angle. That is the angle described by your distal femoral joint line and your proximal tibial joint line. So there is maths to do that, a very, very difficult equations. And uh, Duckdale and Noyes made a brilliant work in order to describe that and how to transfer a varus to a slight valgus, as you can see here. And how to come to this equation? Well, one could explain that, but it's quite tricky. It's the radians of 180. So uh, you have the tibial plateau width. Um, and uh, then uh, you, it, it's just confusing. So let's make it simple. Let's just look at a joint line convergence in this example, eight degrees that you might have. And this might refer during the surgery to normal, which is two degrees. It may not. So, but for how far it will react? Well, this is an enigma. It's often asked, how far will it react? Well, this is why I said it makes sense to make stress X-rays because you get some information about that, but you don't get all of them. Furthermore, during the surgery, I recommend you to have for the execution of everything and to, to control your results, an alignment rod so that you can check under dynamic conditions with your fluoro during the surgery how your joint line or how your level of joint reacts to the change that you applied. But anyhow, as we said, the normal value would be two, but you're actually right now at eight, let's say. So how far will it react? I can tell you, the only thing that I can give you at your hand is how to minimize your error. Because if you don't apply uh, this angle at all and say, well, it may not react at all, and uh, you end up at eight degrees, well, fair to go. But if it overcorrects and goes to two degrees, then you have created, and if you have not um, taken this into consideration, then you have created an overcorrection of some six degrees. So in order to take this into consideration, why not forming a bell curve, um, which gives you the whole barrier that you might have from two degrees, which is normal, up to eight degrees. And the whole range of reaction, therefore, is six degrees. So now, will it re react six degrees and correct itself? Possible. Will it react not at all 
and uh, remain where it is? Well, possible. So, but overall, looking at that, from one side, you have an under anticipation. From the other side, you have an over anticipation. But the range from each side seen is three degrees. And that basically forms the margin of the standard deviation. So why not taking this likely corridor of correction, like in a bell curve, and take these three de uh, degrees of correction for your general assumption of reaction of joint line convergence angle. So now in order uh, to, to form a more, more simple uh, equation for that, we just take the joint line convergence angle, the actual value in this example, eight degrees, and want to go back to normal, which is two degrees. So we just say JLCA minus two, this is six degrees. And then you divide it by two, which is three degrees. And this is what you reduce your overall correction uh, with in order to take it into consideration. So if you now reduce, let's say you plan 12 degrees by three, end up at nine, then you can be quite sure that you have not taken it into consideration at all that the joint line may react from these eight degrees of JLCA. But you can be also quite sure that um, you have not over anticipated it. So therefore this equation JLCA minus two divided by two is quite uh, a golden standard to meet it in the middle. So this is the most complex part of everything. Thanks uh, for your attendance for the first one. Um, remember in these Corona times to keep social distance at least uh, two straight limp lengths. And uh, well, that was the first uh, lecture. I guess we are now open for questions and then we, uh, we uh, hand over to Adrian for HTO and um, novelties. Thank you, Christian. That was indeed a perfect start to this uh, lovely webinar. I apologize for some technical details on my part that, uh, you know, all my computer suddenly wanted to crash. I think it couldn't handle the strength of you two guys. So Christian, for all you, for all those people who are there, Christian is a knee and a hip surgeon. He works out of Hanover in Germany as a part of this group called Orthoprofis. And he also works in London as well with the orthopedic specialist group. Um, any questions right now, Parak, on this? Yes, uh, yes. There, are, there are questions. There are a few questions which have come up. So Christian, okay. excellent talk. You, you did very well. So one of the questions that's come up, you know, uh, which is quite prudent in India, is that in case you don't have the ability to do the long leg x-ray, you know, and do the angles, the MPTA, LDFA. Are there any other options to plan your osteotomy? Is there a plan B? Yeah, that's tricky. I mean, obviously, obviously, uh, that's also a problem in uh, in uh, our um, region. It's not that every orthopedic surgeon has access, direct access to uh, long leg standing X-rays. But right. I would still say, I would still say that it's, it's hard to give a recommendation to say, well, uh, we, can, we can get rid of certain uh, criteria here and just allow it to uh, make it like eyeballing, you know? Um, uh, I, would, I would say it's, from my standpoint, I think it's mandatory to have a full leg standing X-ray. And if you okay. don't have access to it, then why don't you refer your patient to a radiologic department, which there is nearby, to uh, get some get some X-ray imaging, which is appropriate to uh, to um, to apply for planning, and then you are safe to go and uh, deliver a quality for your patient, which is which is satisfactory for for your patient and you yourself. Yeah. So I always thought I felt way better going into surgery when I know what I want to do, and I was well equipped with my all my data and and made a proper planning. So I feel personally planning is like almost 50% of the procedure. Yeah, agreed. Uh, there's a second question, uh, Christian. Uh, once you do your planning, you know, and you find out that the, if the deformity is in the femur or if the deformity is in the tibia. So if you find out the deformity is in the femur, do you always correct in the femur or uh, sometimes you can just get away and correct in the tibia because people find that the tibial osteotomy is slightly easier than a femoral osteotomy. So uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, well, this is exactly our learning curve actually. So I can tell you, I, I answer this one with a little story. 
because uh, in my former practice, we uh, when we started with osteotomy and made some statistics on that, we found out that we operated 99% of our patients at the tibia. And right. obviously we did that because we had no idea on how to treat the femur. So um, the, the answer to the question is, well, of course, you cannot just apply uh, um, the, the chosen surgery uh, to, uh, to the qualification of the surgeon. It needs to fit to the patient. So uh, when we made proper analysis of the malalignments, we found that more than 20% of the overall malalignments is originated in the femur or in both. Well, 10% isolated in the femur and other, another 10% applicable for uh, double level osteotomy. So our answer to this then was uh, to improve our technical skills for femoral osteotomy and not just to perform any other osteotomy. In other words, we, we treated 19% of our patients at the wrong bone, which is, which is a disaster. If a patient comes to you having a kidney problem and you're a liver <laughs> surgeon, you just don't uh, offer liver surgery because you cannot treat kidneys. Yeah, that's a great point, I think. Uh, the next question, Christian, is that, uh, you know, when we calculate all these axes, there's a lot of confusion there with, uh, you know, the Miniachi method, there's a noise Dugdale method. So what is the relationship between all these methods? Are they all consistent? Or how do they behave? They are, they are all consistent. And uh, and obviously you can, if you have a safe, uh, I would, uh, we just recommend this Miniazzi method, which is geometrically quite easy and it leads you quite logically through a process of planning. Anyhow, if you have great experience with ductile noise planning, and if this is your workhorse okay, so and you have good results on that, I would recommend you stick to your planning method because it's it's uh, whatever a surgeon feels safe with is safe for the patient, I guess. And uh, it's not it's not wrong. It's geometrically right to do this planning like that. Um, it's it's not not just our approach that we that we have. So uh, in fact, it was Miniazzi in the work group of Rolly Jakob who described that. And Rolly Jakob, our good friend from Switzerland, was always very. Uh, very ambitious about osteotomy. And I think he had a great approach here in, this, in how to describe a planning and this Miniazzi planning of an osteotomy. Okay, Christian, there's one more question. And Sachin, by the time he answers the question, do you want to set up your slides to introduce and then we will yeah. go on with the talk? So I so just got Ashur to set it up for us. Yeah. So I'm just yeah. going to ask this question, uh, Christian. The question is that in cases of tibial metafascial varus, the mechanical axis is different than the anatomical axis for tibia. So which angles should be taken, the MPTA or anything else? This question is from Dr. Nikunj Agarwal. Well, you take, um, you take the uh, MPTA, obviously, and if there is a difference in the angle, then you take the mechanical oh. values. We plan on mechanical angles, and I just um, made a, made a, well, generalization. Well, these are always wrong, but for a basic talk, maybe explaining enough. So obviously there might be cases where the anatomical axis and the mechanical axis of the tibia are different. Well, if you have a shaft fracture or any other, uh, like rachitis, um, uh, disease or whatever, then you might have to, um, you may have to, uh, uh, anatomical axis of the tibia with a big, curvation in the center of it, which gives you a cora. And then you have a center of rotation of angulation in the middle of the tibia shaft, which leaves you uh, up with a different concept of correction. Okay. So this might be something for uh, a shaft correction with a nail. But anyhow, um, right. this, is not, right. this is not really applicable for, uh, for osteotomies about the knee. We are referring to osteotomies about the knee here. And these are uh, rather kind of not part of this Cora concept, because the more you go into the puristic Cora concept, anatomy around the knee drags you away from that. So the more yeah. you go closer to the knee, the lesser you can apply the Cora concept, because sometimes uh, there is simply no cut possible due to anatomic circumstances. Okay, okay, thanks, thanks, Christian. Thank so, you, Christian. So, so Sachin, uh, can you uh, quickly introduce uh, Dr. Christian formally? Yeah. And then we move on uh, uh, with the talks. 
Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, so the master that you hear, you just heard was none other than Dr. Christian Clay. The next speaker up is going to be Professor Adrian Wilson. He's a leader member of the ESCA Arthroscopy Society and the ESCA Osteotomy Society as well. So uh, Adrian is no stranger to India. He's been in India on a couple of occasions and he's very happy to be, we're very happy to have him with us and share his expertise on how do you make osteotomy safe. So Adrian, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Sachin. Um, I'm just gonna see if I can make technology work. Uh, there we go. Tell me if you can see my screen. How's that looking? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's uh, interesting times, isn't it? Uh, um, I'm a little bit coffee myself at the moment. I had the coronavirus, and um, you know, it's a it's a very very difficult situation. But I think it's amazing that you've been able to put this on, Parag and Sachin, uh, to put together all these people um, and doing these wonderful webinars. And I'm just very honoured um, to be joining uh, with you, and also with my good friend Christian, who who I speak to on a daily basis. So I was going to cover surgical technique. Um, and I was going to um, try and fly through the basics of HTO because it's, it's, it's the workhorse um, and then talk about a very exciting, easy new technique myself and Christian have developed um, for pr protecting the neurovascular structures posteriorly, which is one of the main concerns of anyone carrying out an osteotomy procedure. Um, we're also wanting our patients to have a safe procedure, one that they can rehabilitate on quickly. And a real concern for us is the hinge. And we've come up uh, with this new idea uh, for a hinge screw, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So there's a lot of educational videos online. Uh, our HTO video I did with Neil Thomas uh, many years ago now, and it's, it is outdated, but it's, it still takes you through the basics quite nicely. And I, I, I'd advise anyone interested in doing osteotomy surgery to take a look at, at this video, because um, although it is slightly outdated, I think it's a very nice step-by-step -step um, presentation. Also, obviously, on ViewMedi and the other forums, there are uh, good videos to work off. So very importantly is the setup. Um, here we see a patient supine with a side support footrest, but look at the look at the leg here contralaterally. It's actually out of the way. It, the, the table's been broken, and that allows us to come in from the opposite side uh, to operate on the affected leg. So here, right knee, we'd be operating from the left side. Uh, we'd have the C arm coming in from this side. Um, and this really helps you, this little trick of putting the leg out of the way. The tools are actually very simple. You need some sort of periosteal elevator that's curved. You need uh, radiolucent blunt homans. Uh, you need some laminar spreaders and you need some osteotomes. This is a fantastic um, device from uh, Stryker. Um, it's, uh, it's called their precision saw blade. Um, and um, here we can see, oh, my video is not running very well. That doesn't bode well, there's a lot of videos. Um, and it's, it's basically a saw that has a limited excursion at its tip. And we, we found this a very useful tool in osteotomy surgery because um, you're, you're much more confident with that limited excursion. You can even use your finger posteriorly as a retractor as you go underneath particularly the femur. And we think this is an essential bit of kit. So um, if we look historically at how osteotomies were carried out, um, Carl Nissen, when, when Neil Thomas was in Stanmore training uh, in, the, in the 60s, Nissen just used to use an osteotome through the skin, didn't even make an incision. And here you can see a very extensile approach on the right uh, with a tomafix plate in. And we've really moved away from this. Uh, originally, we went to an oblique and then to, to back to a longitudinal using an MIS technique. The, uh, the landmarks for osteotomy surgery can be seen in this uh, video that runs, just about. So we can see the joint line, just click it along. I've marked out the pairs. I'm three fingers below the pairs. You can see the posterior cortex is marked at the back there. And you can see the front, the tibial tubercle. And we wanna be three centimeters below the joint line slightly posterior, just extending beyond the pairs. And that's my incision, which is approximately four centimeters in length. So if we then look at what we do very importantly with the MCL, this is something that we, whoops, let me get rid of that. We constantly get asked, what do we do with the MCL? So here we can see the road bumps uh, of the pes anserinus. We open that up and release the pes uh, rather than cut it. 
And then we can take this flap uh, here uh, and we can then elevate that flap, which is the leading into the superficial MCL. And you want to get a, a, a very full release of the superficial MCL. Otherwise you can cause more trouble uh, than you uh, than, than actually cure uh, by actually tightening the, the medial side of the knee. And Agnes Kirshner's experiment showed that very nicely. Here you can see us identifying the patella tendon at the front. So now we're completely protected front and back and we've released the MCL. This is a beautiful picture of Christian's an artist and uh, he's done this lovely picture and it's, it's, a, it's a very nice way of thinking about the start point and the finish point for your, for your shooting of K-wire to the hinge. And you wanna imagine the fibula head as, a, as wearing a little hat and you wanna shoot the tip of the hat from the head. Um, and we want to be roughly between five and 10 millimeters in terms of where the saw blade stops from the lateral cortex. So if we then look at the, at the uh, guide wire position, you can see I'm slightly flat here, but I'm heading to a nice position uh, on the uh, top of the, uh, of the fibula. Um, and then I'm gonna place my second K wire parallel. Now it's very important that this is done in the, uh, the knee is flexed, the point that this is done in line with the, with the knee joint. So you want here, I'm actually not quite flexed enough. You wanna flex the knee and you wanna see perfectly through the knee so that your two wires are in the plane of the joint line. And then you can see us making our, um, our cut. And we do this in the standard way, as you can see to, as I say, five to 10 millimeters. We then uh, use Staubley's concept of the biplane. Here you can see that the initial cut has been made and you can see that I've stopped uh, four fifths uh, just below, there's a ridge just below here on the tibia where we stop. And then I wanna come up at an angle of 110 degrees with my saw. We rotate the foot slightly away to do this. We always visualize uh, the frontal plane of the tibia and have that in mind all the time as we then make this second biplane cut. And then we want to make sure that the osteotomy is mobile. Um, so we have to insert osteotomes. Now, it's very important that you don't thump these in with the mallet. You want the, oste you want the osteotomy to be mobile enough that these basically can be put in by hand. That's really important because otherwise you can end up with hinge fractures and other issues. So we now are very much want to see this almost before we place the osteotomes. We really want to free up um, the um, osteotomy. If we then look once more at uh, how mobile, this is how mobile we want the osteotomy to be so that we can thumb in the osteotomes and not tap them in with, too hard with a mallet. Now the gap that we create wants to be trapezoidal, slightly bigger at the back, slightly more uh, smaller at the front. And that's because of the shape of the tibia. The tibia is longer at the back than it is at the front. So we want to maintain an even opening. We want to have this gap slightly smaller than this gap and the gap needs to be trapezoidal. Now, one uh, little technique that we developed uh, because we went MIS was to insert two wires either side of the osteotomy and use those rather than, a lam rather than place the laminar spreader inside the osteotomy. We use the wires to actually open the osteotomy and it's just a nice technique. Here you can see we were making a video here and I failed a little with my cosmesis. This is a very small incision, um, but this was a full length video and it was just to show, um, just to show how we do that. So what about placing a bone wedge? Now you don't need to place a bone wedge. Um, uh, Staubli showed with the Tomafix plate, 21 millimeters of opening with no problem with healing, but there are some distinct advantages with placing a bone wedge. It helps you be less invasive. It helps you to control and maintain the slope, either change it or maintain it uh, by, by cutting the bone wedge to the shape that you want. There's no need for a laminar spreader once you've inserted the bone wedge, the operation is done and then you can apply the plate and it makes, uh, makes plate positioning much, much easier. And it definitely causes less bleeding, less swelling and earlier rehabilitation um, in the patients that receive a bone wedge. And we've, we've um, published on that. And we can use smaller plates and we can get back to activity more quickly. And we see rapid union at three months in approximately 50% of the patients. The other 50%, the bone wedge just dies away and then you just see a classic um, healing. Here we can see how we prepare the bone wedge. We're just taking the top of the femoral head off and then we literally cut, cut the wedge with the saw according to what we want. Um, and it's really quite easy to do. And again, with this saw, with a little bit of experience, it becomes very safe. And then in terms of placing it, um, 
we just tap the bone wedge in, the laminar spreaders are either side of the wires, the wedge is in, then we can release the laminar spreader and we have complete control of the osteotomy. Now we can place our plate. So we've got first generation angle stable PUDU plates, second generation Tomafix, third generation now, our preferred plates, the new clip active motion plates, type one and type two. And this is what our go-to plate is now for both tibial and femoral osteotomy. So in terms of the uh, placing of the osteotomy plate, uh, it's uh, very straightforward and you're all familiar with how to fix plates. So I'm gonna move on very quickly, but I'm delighted to say that Christian's uh, developed some lovely new towers and some nice uh, a quick fix guide that goes over the top of this. And these new um, uh, tools are gonna speed up this operation and make it easier. And here you can see at the end of the operation, this is a very small uh, osteotomy, uh, small incision, I mean, um, just three centimeters. Uh, and when, you know, when you've done enough, you can start to make incisions like this, but you really need to be um, quite experienced. We always use some form of cryotherapy and here you can see Physiolab, which everyone gets at the end of the procedure. And again, I think this really uh, is a game changer for these patients in terms of reducing that initial swelling that they can get, which gives them almost like a pseudo compartment syndrome that, that we used to see with our tibial osteotomies, which were painful. So what are the three main concerns with uh, HTO surgery? The first is what the hell do I do with the MCL? I brushed over it a bit because I wanna show you our new technique. The second concern is neurovascular injury. And even in experienced hands, we see reports of the vessels being damaged um, in the UK and abroad. Whenever you do a big meeting, you say hands up who's seen a neurovascular injury, there's always a fair show of hands. And this is something that everyone worries about. Um, and it's something that we think we've, we've nailed with our uh, new technique. And then how can we protect the hinge? And I'm gonna to talk to you about our new concept for hinge screw. So vascular complications are, as I say, something that we're very worried about. Dietrich often gives this talk um, at our course, uh, Dietrich Pape from Luxembourg. Um, and uh, we've learned over the years to become more aware of the anatomy around the knee, and particularly the, the uh, relationship of the aberrant branch of the tibial artery, the anterior tibial artery in relationship to the popliteus. And I'll show you that in a second. This fortunately is a cadaveric image showing how close we can get at the back of the knee. And um, there's some nice papers out there looking at the uh, prevalence of branching patterns um, that can be uh, read at your leisure. Now, an interesting thing is, what is the safest position to have the knee in when you're, when you're cutting the bone? Is it safe for inflection or is it safe for an extension? And actually, it makes no difference because the vessels are in a very fixed position and don't move according to how you bend and extend the knee. So it doesn't really make any difference whatsoever. It's surgeon's preference. So again, uh, Christian's artwork comes in here. Uh, we can see the popliteus and we can see this nasty little branch going down the back behind anterior to the popliteus. And this can bleed like stink. Um, and it's something that we're uh, uh, aware of now. And also just generally speaking, we need to make sure that we're on the bone as we clear over to the fibula head. Um, and it's quite difficult to achieve that. Here you can see a near uh, a radiolucent um, retractor. Um, and here you can see Christian, the wizard in action. Um, he is doing his uh, uh, live surgery, this is actually. And you can see him through a very small incision doing his tibial osteotomy. And you can see how he's fighting a little bit with these structures at the back. The Homan is constantly fighting with the tension of the MCL. And I'm gonna show you how we, can, uh, uh, how we can help with that. Here he's making his biplane cut, all very impressive. And so uh, Christian, uh, really it was Christian's concept, has come up with this fantastic idea of a radiolucent retractor that Newtip have made for us that has a wire. Once we've cleared the back of the tibia, we can lock this retractor into position and pretty soon we're gonna be able to guide the saw onto that as well. So we have a fixed envelope so that the surgeon can be absolutely sure he's cleared the back, he's locked in position and he's on a nice trajectory with his saw. So this is a this is a video that we'll I can make available. Uh, and, uh, it's uh, we're going to post it online. It's a, it's a video we made with Matthew Olivier, a good friend from Marseille, and Ronald van Heerwarden, as well as Ragbir Kakar, my partner in London. Um, and we we think it shows uh, the salient points of this new technique very nicely. So here is uh, a chart uh, of the different branches, similar images to what you've already seen. This is what we want to prevent. So we need to know our surgical anatomy make an adequate exposure, and we need to have an appropriate positioning for our tools. 
Now, the, re the retractor needs to protect the neurovascular structures. Here we can see a metal version. Of course, this isn't the final uh, version. This is just a prototype that we were messing around with in the cadaveric facility. And you can see the wire going in and out. This is how we lock it into, into the bone. Uh, and we locked it into the back of this um, model. And you can see how we can get nicely into position and it's uh, beautifully shaped and it's um, a work in progress with new clip that will be out very, very shortly. So uh, what about the surface anatomy? So I've, we've marked out the back of the tibia and the joint line. We can see, uh, we can see the femoral condyle. We can see the MCL, superficial MCL. We can see the pes coming in. So in terms of the surgical approach, we, Christian likes a very slightly oblique incision, uh, moving from slightly posterior to anterior. Um, and again, two to three centimeters below the joint line. So what we did in the, what we did in this uh, video is, which isn't playing very well, What we did is we made a small incision. This is the expert's incision. And then what we're gonna do is open it up so we can actually see what's going on and have a look at the anatomy. Come on. Such a shame. Just bear with me. And I might have to move on. Just tell me when I maybe I can uh, I have to present it from my computer I have the same video here obviously we can do this okay um why don't we share that at the end Christian shall I finish right. off and then right. finish off finish off and then I show it from my side here let me just see it might play it's thinking about it it's five minutes long and it's uh I wanted to jump through it anyway but okay we'll see if we can get you to uh, yeah, to, um, finish, finish it okay. and then we, uh, So um, with the hinge screw, this is, uh, again, uh, something that we're all concerned about is protecting the hinge. Uh, we know about where we should be heading for. We've already covered that. Um, and if we look back at what we did in the, in the early years with um, uh, staples and uh, before we had angle stable plates, I think my, I think my Zoom is failing me. There we go. We can see these uh, staples that didn't really, sorry guys, it's uh, struggling a bit. Anyway, um, so a very clever concept came out of, uh, of new clip, which is the hinge wire, which is something actually um, uh, was uh, published by Matthew Olivier. And this is an idea from Greg, the CEO, who's not a doctor, but he's absolutely obsessed with osteotomy and it was his idea to place a protecting wire and we found that actually increased the load to breakage by 800 percent by placing a wire um, and um, working together with Sebastian Perra uh, who's Mathieu's um, colleague who's now working in Abu Dhabi with Charlie Brown they um, perfected this hinge wire technique really nicely with, uh, with the help of Nucleus. And this is something that we did as a standard uh, procedure. We placed a hinge wire. Here you can see in this tibial osteotomy that we're, um, we're placing the wire to protect uh, the hinge. And we were very happy with this. And we know um, from the um, uh, AO techniques with the Tomafix that uh, a, a screw can be used um, in the appropriate hole to actually compress. But we actually think this is a much better technique actually go back to uh, basic orthopedics which involves using a screw 
um, to, um, to compress. So here we have the, the classification of Takauchi. This is what we want to avoid, a hinge fracture. Type one actually is very benign and not something we're worried about. Type two, we are worried about that. That uh, uh, goes down into the prox proximal tip fifth joint and can cause some instability. And type three, intraarticular, is obviously something that we worry about and we fix there and then at the time of the surgery. So here we can see uh, we've got our, um, our uh, uh, compression screw in position. Initially, we quite like this concept. And again, uh, my good friend and his artwork coming in uh, to show us um, that, um, uh, uh, let me go back and see if this video will work. To show us uh, how we can get direct compression of the hinge which is something that we were really interested in and something that we're now working on with Mathieu as a, a, a biomechanical experiment in Marseille and something that we started to do in our clinical practice and we're already seeing um, a really positive result from, from that. Um, I'll just let this run. It's not showing, it's okay. So here we're on a sore bone. Uh, this is at one of our courses and you can see uh, Christian in action. I'm the cameraman. Uh, and we are just showing how on the saw bone we can open, we can open, we can open, and then eventually the hinge goes. Uh, the biplane uh, maintaining a reasonably good position there, and then as Christian um, opens it up, um, you'll see the hinge go. And here we see there's a loud crack, and now there it goes. So the hinge is gone. So the idea was how can we how can we protect that? So we then went into the cadaveric lab and we placed um, uh, we placed a screw directly across the hinge, um, and we're eyeballing this. Obviously, we used some fluoro. This is in Matt Dawson's lab, so we had a fluoro available, and we drilled and we placed, and then we we looked to see what we could achieve when we went to open up the osteotomy. And it was really quite impressive what we could achieve in on this very soft cadaveric bone once the screw was in position. Um, and you can see it here on the fluoro, screws in position and we're ready to go with our opening. And then we tested the opening and you can see we get some fun, this is cadaveric bone. So this is really unusual uh, that we could open this so much without the hinge breaking. And we were very impressed with this when we did the experiment. Here you can see a massive opening so let's look at a few cases. Here is a, a distal femoral osteotomy, minimally invasive, a small incision, two, two wires converging in the standard way. We've got our new clip plate in position locked on and we can see our hinge wire, our guide wire for the screw coming in here. And we're just doing that. Literally, we're eyeballing that. We are in the process of developing jigs, but this, you know, placing one of these in the center of the bone is actually relatively easy to do. Just have to find the edge of the bone. You can see the guide wire has gone down the hinge wires, uh, which we placed initially. And then we check on the lateral view and we can see uh, that the, um, uh, we get a very nice position. We've moved from slightly front to back, so we know we're in the middle of the bone um, and we've placed our hinge wire. And then uh, we come to actually fix. And here you can see, and we just advance. Uh, this is an Acumed. Uh, you can use any of the um, uh, differential pitch screws to achieve fixation. Here's the case, here's the screw. And then we see, this is the patient. This is less than, this is less than a day. We did the surgery at four o'clock in the afternoon. This is in the morning on the ward round, myself and Christian doing these surgeries together now in London. And you can see how this guy who's had a distal femoral osteotomy, he's taking weight. And when he, when he advances and walks towards me, I ask him, I say, how much pain are you in? It's always an important question on the ward round. And he looks me in the eye and says, I've got absolutely no pain whatsoever. And that is really quite unusual. Now, we did take this gentleman, uh, partial weight bearing, uh, 20 kilos we allowed for four weeks. Um, but we were more confident with the hinge screw. And now we need to work with our biomechanical uh, experiment and work out exactly what can we do? How quickly can we get these patients going? Because, of course, we go for full weight bearing on the tibia. Here you can see a case, AP and lateral post-operative views. This gentleman's five weeks post uh, left, DHO, uh, left HTO, uh, and this is him the day after surgery. Again, no pain, and he felt as a as a 
uh, a blinded trial uh, because we didn't know we were going to do this. Um, he felt much more comfortable on the right compared to the left. Um, it just felt more secure. Although this gentleman was off his crutches at four weeks when he came to see me for the pre-op chat for the other side. So he, he did very well with the, with the left side as well. So HTO surgery is straightforward. Follow the steps. Um, we now have a sol solution to protect the neurovascular bundle. Um, hinge protection, we believe, is paramount. It's going to be a focus now for osteotomy. Um, rapid rehabilitation can be achieved with this, as well as by using a bone wedge and a, a physio lab cryotherapy device. We have a centre uh, for osteotomy in London. Please um, come and visit us um, and uh, come and uh, see. Ronald Van Heerwarden also comes on a regular basis, and sometimes myself, Christian Ronald, and RAGS all operate together on some of the more tricky cases. We're running a, an osteotomy masterclass at Lords, uh, should we be open, in February of next year. And we'd love to have you for some practical hands-on demos and some other talks on osteotomy. I'm just going to see if I can get this video to work on my screen. And if I can't, then I'm going to um, get Christian to, to go for it. Uh, let me have a quick look. Everyone's going to see it. Lovely, Adrian. So Adrian, while you're getting the video, I've got a couple of questions coming up. Maybe Christian sure. can start answering those questions. Um, yep. Christian, the, the question that's been asked quite a lot is that which is the single most factor which is more important in choosing the plate? And is it the design of the plate or does it is it the material of the plate that decides the outcome? Yeah, I can tell you it's, it's neither nor uh, in my hands today. <laughs> um, the more we do this, the more we find that, um, that uh, there is, uh, the, the plates that we use today are from Euclid and uh, this is the active motion uh, family. Uh, providing great strength uh, at, at very reasonable dimensions. But uh, what is also very, very important is the technique. And as we learned to secure our hinges with these hinge screws over the last couple of months, more and more, we found that the patients are very, very happy with a kind of a double fixation, which is not um, uh, visualizable from out from the outer so you don't have a different approach for that you just make a little step incision in some of the cases sometimes you can just go through your normal approaches so um, this is why I like to have rather a small plate and uh, because it's it's less disturbing for the patient at the end yeah but, and but so this it, it, it was uh, it, when they did the biomechanical testing it, it, it kind of outperformed all of the others despite its small size absolutely Absolutely. So this is why I say, uh, what is more important? Is it material? Is it well? Well, it's it's the plate today that we have. We have uh, these um, these nuclear plates that were tested on the same testing module uh, against Tomofix, which, which was always the golden standard plate. And we uh, and we see that there is uh, that that this plate actually outperformed the others. Uh, thus, it it's very small in dimension. So there's another question on the plate right now. I thought I'll just ask it. Can we use sure. a standard tibial plate, a standard approximate tibia plate from the trauma system instead of using a sophisticated osteotomy plate? So that's come up well, quite often as well. Yeah, yeah. One could, of course, one can do lots of things, but these these plates are specially uh, calculated. So I guess it was uh, really um, it, it was it was a great uh, challenge back then, and it was really great work that was mastered by AO and in introducing these uh, these Tomofix plates according to the ideas of Alex Staubli, because they were really designed to be specific plates for proximal uh, um, tibial osteotomies. And um, and what, well, what's what, what what's interesting, um, uh, Sachin, is that even if you use a design plate that places the screw strategically in the top of the tibia, if you don't use it properly, you see uh, you see fracture, you see failure. So, for right. instance, take the workhorse uh, Tomofix. If you don't compress, if you don't swap out your compression screw for a, a, a locking screw, you are quite likely to see failure at hole D. And uh, that's how the most common failure type, even in the sophisticated plate, um, so I think they do need to be dedicated. I think you're asking an awful lot of the plate. Um, uh, and uh, it's the geometry of not only the plate, but also uh, where the screws are differentially being positioned proximally and distally that is um, um, key. Uh, uh, yeah. I, 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 so that would be my answer. So I think that's very important because you want those screws 
to really go and you know act like a trampoline to support the osteotomy, which is very critical. Uh, there are another couple of questions which are coming on the MCL. Um, let me just let me just show this quickly, Tash. I'm okay. going to whiz through Love it. It's a, okay. it's a uh, let me see if it works. Is it, can you okay. see it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, can you play it through? Yes. Yeah. So it's going to get to where we were. It seems to be running now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, the. Um, So we, we see a, an expert incision here. And uh, as I said before, for the sake of this, uh, we, we opened it right up so we could really show the anatomy. So yeah. now we go, this is uh, uh, somebody who's fairly, um, fairly confident um, uh, uh, showing a, um, uh, and then showing a slightly longer incision. So then, now we've taken off all of the, uh, all of the um, skin and the subcutaneous fat. And we see the patella tendon and we're marking out the biplane cut at the front there. So that's how we would make our biplane cut. And then as we come down on this specimen, uh, we show this is something that's, that everyone gets confused about. What do I do with the PEZ? And here we're popping uh, a Leahy retractor inside and simply opening it up. And that is spreading the hamstrings away from the tibia. And that is how you release the hamstrings, but at the same time you preserve them so that you can use them there and then or use them at a later date or of course leave them for the patient for function. So that's what you do with the uh, hamstrings. Now let's have a look at the traditional approach to how we would release this MCL. So here's the MCL and normally what we would do is we would come in from the front and we would, uh, we would start to dissect down the back and we would release it a little bit like we do in a TKR, scratching the periosteum to release the MCL. And that would give us access to the back of the tibia. But look at the angle. Look at how we're fighting with the soft tissues to get round the corner. And of course, we want to place our retractor ideally from low to high so that we're not fighting these soft tissues. So it was Christian who came up with this brilliant idea. And like all things, it's a, it's a very simple one. Without doing anything to the MCL, we're, we're making an incision on the back of the tibia, just at the back of the MCL. Now we can scratch all the way up. We haven't done anything to the MCL, it's not released, but we can scratch in a much more appropriate way from low to high, all the way across the fibula head. We know we've released absolutely everything. Then we can place our retractor. We can lock that into position. And now we know as long as we're over that retractor, there's no way we can damage the neurovascular bundle. So we've gone from the back. Now we release the MCL. So you see how we come down, we work on the MCL and we release it to a point where we're happy. And when the tension is appropriate and the tension needs to be fairly minimal, we place a second retractor and we tense down the MCL in a more traditional way to how you're all used to doing your osteotomies. And now we can cut the bone. And as long as we stay on top of that retractor, there is no way you can cut the neurovascular bundle. And we think this is a very simple, uh, but very, very useful way of preventing neurovascular injury in osteotomy surgery. So there we go. I'm just glad Lovely. I got to show that. Lovely. So there are two questions on the MCL. The first sure. is that when we expose the proximal tibia, if we see any osteophytes, uh, you know, which are sort of popping out from the medial joint line on the tibia, should we release yeah. them? That's one. And second, if we release the MCL, not completely, be, you know, it results in an incomplete release, Will that cause a flexion contracture post-op? So can you quickly answer both yeah. these questions? So, so uh, it's not common for us to do bony releases uh, when we're doing, because we're not up around the joint line with the MCL release. We're actually below the joint line. So we're away from osteophyte territory. If we were up around the joint line, we'd be around the posterior oblique ligament. We'd be releasing the soft tissues that are very important, the stability of the knee, the MCL, and its most critical part. So where we're actually doing the releasing is where we're making the cut. Um, so it's not, it's not uh, uh, common for us to do any bony work unless we're revising somebody else's osteotomy or a previous fracture and removing osteophytes um, because uh, we need the anatomy to look normal. The second question was, what happens if you leave a tight MCL? Well, we know in the lab that the pressure, uh, sens pressure sensors that were placed during the brilliant experiment of Lobenhofer and Agnes Kirchner showed a significant rise in, in the pressures in the medial compartment of the knee if you don't fully release the MCL. 
In other words, you make the patients get off the table far worse than they started. It's absolutely critical to fully release the superficial MCL. And if you don't, you almost certainly will get a knee flexion contracture. Now, if you, if you start off with a knee flexion contracture, which is common in these patients, we can easily get, with an average osteotomy of eight to nine millimeters, which is our average size, we can easily get rid of 10 to 15 degrees of fixed flexion by releasing the soft tissues and releasing the MCL um, in, in the way that we, we've just shown in the videos. So it's a very powerful tool for getting the legs straight um, in the sagittal plane. Okay, so one last question before we pop off to uh, Christian's talk on the femoral osteotomy, and it concerns the hinge screw. There are two questions on the same. Uh, the question is that, is a hinge screw better than a hinge wire? That's one. And second is that, should we tighten or you know fix the screw first before we perform the osteotomy? Or should we leave a wire in, make the osteotomy, open it, fix it, and then pass the screw? Yeah, then the final is the technique we use. So I think the hinge wire does a great job. I think there's some nice basic science that we have now at our disposal to look at showing a significant uh, increase in stability for the hinge. Um, so we use the hinge wire technique, but we then swap the hinge wire. Once we've performed the osteotomy, we then swap the hinge wire for a guide wire and then we place the screw. And that gives us ongoing stability of the hinge once the patient gets off the table. So we're getting double fixation, we're getting lateral fixation, and we're getting medial fixation. And we think this is going to be a game changer. Okay, perfect. So Christian, are you happy to jump into your talk now? I am. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, I yeah, need to love. share my screen. Wait yes, a second. Please. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. That was great, actually, and good that the video worked so that we could show uh, what it's about to uh, to protect the neurovascular bundle and and uh, showing all these novel techniques. Okay, um, so the next one is on distal femoral osteotomy. Um, as we now learned uh, that there is a standard workhorse of osteotomy, which is the HTO. Obviously, as we mentioned right from the start, there are 20% of these malalignments originated at the femur. So we need to somewhat take a look at this bone and uh, make ourselves familiar uh, with osteotomy uh, about the distal femur. Um, because as a matter of fact, as I said, we made our own calculations in Hanover based on the data from 2014. And we found that amongst our almost 350 osteotomies, 20% of them had femoral uh, deformities. So um, you never know just by looking at either varus or valgus alignment, whether the alignment is uh, problematic in the femur or in the tibia or in both. So um, if you make proper analysis, according to the Paley nomenclature that I've just um, in the first uh, lecture presented to you, you will come up with the fact that there is even various deformities like you can see in this case at the uh, femoral side. And if you perform just a normal standard HDO because you assume that it's a various deformity so it needs to be fixed at the tibia, then you end up with the proper alignment of uh, the Mikulic line maybe. Thus in this case, even that was not, uh, was not achieved. Uh, but what you create is a hypercorrection of the MPTA. So you end up with a post-operative MPTA of sometimes around 100 degrees. And so therefore you create an oblique joint line and this oblique joint line is, uh, uh, is oblique in the wrong direction. So you create a melalignment, which in fact is worse than the one that the patient started with. And at the end, this really causes shear forces at the level of joint and shear forces cannot withstand, uh, cannot be withstand by cartilage well. So as polyethylene and uh, just think of that when you, uh, when you uh, perform a total knee procedure and aim for 90 degrees. So you might end up with something, uh, something like that and that uh, obviously will, uh, will be transferred uh, to total knee arthroplasty sooner or later. So you need to incorporate now the femur, as we learned. And um, doing this, we need to take a look at where we came from. And obviously, uh, when I started, we had these lateral open wedges, and they were somewhat problematic because they are, are associated with uh, lateral lengthening and therefore IT bend problems. 
um, uh, open uh, opening wedge at the distal femur uh, causes uh, furthermore um, a problem with the stability because uh, the the surface of the osteotomy at the distal femur is smaller in fact than at the tibia so therefore it's kind of tricky to get this uh, stable um, you don't have a uh, su such an, an anatomical construct like the proximal tip fit with its strong fibers from the fibula head saving the hinge. So fa hinge failures, as you can see in the lower images, were quite, were quite common. And therefore, all overall, um, mostly bone graft was necessary and so on and so on. So th that was not very, uh, very um, uh, inviting to, uh, to do a femoral osteotomy like that. So we reminded ourselves of the good old blade plate for fracture use, which uh, delivered way more stability. And um, the blade plate still is the golden standard for, um, for a stable fixation. But of course, everyone who ever tried to apply this one uh, in a state of fracture or when you, um, when you created a so-called uh, iatrogenic fracture, um, like an osteotomy, latest when you tap the blade in, uh, the hinge is gone. So um, the problem now was that uh, for these blade plates, the normal in, uh, osteotomy cut was rather horizontal. And when you close that, as Tahilin pointed, um, you don't have a complete matchup of the cortex uh, after closure uh, for closing wedge osteotomies. So therefore, uh, it makes sense to, uh, to perform the cut rather oblique so that you, based from the hinge, uh, draw a line to the starting cortex, either medial or lateral. And uh, from that starting cortex, you just um, uh, look for the specific line that just creates a rectangular structure and then you go a little bit up and a little bit low to have an isosceles triangle that you can um, can cut out and once you have cut out an isosceles triangle after closure you have full cortical support and therefore no offset which gives you higher stability so Looking at it once again, defy your hinge, draw a line to the starting cortex, uh, which is rectangular, hitting uh, the cortex in the middle. Uh, and then um, you just go a little bit up and a little bit below uh, according to your planning, so your wedge base height. Uh, and then you just close the osteotomy and have full cortical support. We applied this to the technique of Staubli uh, to uh, do it in a biplanar fashion, as you can see here. So it's just the posterior three quarters of the femur that are cut uh, in this uh, oblique way. Um, the anterior quarter of the femur is cut um, uh, as an ascending cut. And uh, this is uh, so -called, the so-called biplanar, which gives you uh, multiple options. First at hand, your overall osteotomy can be lower, then it gives you a different uh, idea for uh, rotation uh, profile, so you're, you're not that much in danger to create a, a rotational deformity. And, um, well, the, the bony surface is bigger, so therefore the healing, you always have initial contact in this anterior part, the healing is, uh, is quicker. And then you see also this hinge wire concept, uh, like we uh, introduced that for the, t uh, for the tibia already. So now the traditional technique goes like that. And uh, whoever did a single plane distal femoral osteotomy, which failed at the hinge, knows uh, what a nightmare it can be to get this uh, fracture reduced. And you never know uh, in which direction it was really uh, created. So it, re it really is a good idea to perform this as a biplanar osteotomy, which we do routinely now, as we said, the, uh, the surface of the osteotomy is bigger, so therefore healing is uh, accelerated and there is uh, less uh, volume of bony resection. These are all advantages. So we were quite pleased with the osteotomy itself. The only thing that we weren't quite happy with uh, was the, um, the overall approach, because uh, for the distal femur, this is quite, um, uh, excessive and extensile that you uh, when you when you cut everything out. So um, we developed something like a mypo uh, plating uh, for for the distal femur and a minimal invasive approach. And if you look into uh, into scientific data, you see that Farouk, who, uh, who published uh, working in Hanover um, about about that. 
uh, then you can see that mycoplatin really uh, gives you an advantage for perfusion in terms of periosteal and uh, even intraosseous perfusion, which is crucial because when you uh, perform an osteotomy, then you want to apply healing later on. And of course, it does only heal uh, if you have blood supply. So this is such a minimal invasive incision, but let's go uh, and proceed and I will show you how to do this then. And obviously it's not based on the length of the incision alone. Uh, the skin heals from uh, side to side and not from end to end. So therefore feel free to really um, start with a, a larger incision than that, let's say 10 centimeters, but be very critical about uh, devascularizing the bone and lifting up the whole muscle to not destroy uh, your blood supply. So this is the positioning that we have. Once again, the table is broken, as you can see, to get some access to the, uh, in this case, standard uh, uh, varization in a valgus case from the medial side. You make your approach, lift up the uh, vastus medialis after incising the fascia of the vastus medialis, and then you come to the uh, intermuscular septum, which you uh, incise or cauterize to get some access to the posterior part of the femur. And just like we have shown you in the tibia, you surround it with a, a periosteal elevator and free the complete uh, posterior surrounding of the femur and put in some either Hohmann, or in my case, I just use with this precision saw from Stryker my finger to prevent uh, me from cutting into the uh, popliteal artery, which is really very, very close. So I rather cut into my finger than into the patient's artery, but in fact, as this uh, saw is really just moving at the very tip, it's quite safe uh, to, to place your glove even beside this moving uh, saw tip, and uh, therefore you have a quite safe um, option to cut it. Now, when you cut it, you need to be very sure that the posterior part of the femur looks uh, or is a little bit kidney shaped. Knowing that, uh, when you now uh, draw your, um, your wedge and uh, think of this wedge that you have cut out, you need to make sure, I don't know, it's just half of that, the, the important part is missing. Let me point my cursor here. You need to make sure that you cut the contralateral part of the arcuate uh, line. If you don't do that, it always remains as an obstacle for closure when you do close wedge distal femoral osteotomies. And this is then the hypomoclearon uh, over which your hinge may break if you have not cut this specific area completely. So um, let's go a uh, couple of steps further. Uh, these are just the images out of our publication that we uh, published in the uh, uh, orthopedic technique uh, journal. Um, this is uh, the planning. Uh, just like for the HTO, obviously for the femur, uh, the same applies. You need to uh, make a proper planning to check where the malalignment is. In this case, you see an MLDFA of 83 degrees and the planning transfers that to 89. So this is just uh, bringing it to complete normal means. And here you see such a live surgery. I guess it makes sense to mute it. <laughs> Hopefully it's muted right now. Can someone give me feedback if it's muted? I just see my video yes, it here. Is muted. It is muted. So now this is the incision of uh, the um, of the vastus medialis, and uh, you lift up the uh, the fascia. So you just incise the fascia and move around with some uh, retractor or with your finger just to lift it up in a blunt manner. And once you lifted it up, there is three vessels on the medial side. We call them the three sisters. And this is mostly the level uh, of osteotomy. So this is where I then uh, cauterize uh, the intermuscular septum to gain some access to the back. And once you have access to the back, you just take your finger, stick it in and free all the posterior surrounding. And you really can touch the complete back of the femur with your finger up to the contralateral side. And, uh, and make a rendezvous maneuver at the other side. So now I just defy the level of osteotomy. And for a close match, obviously there is two K wires. That fire four K wires to, um, to defy uh, the, the slope orientation because I found it very, uh, very complicated to fire four K wires at a time 
uh, which just give you an orientation and and uh, and getting the parallelity done is very complex. So I like to just measure like this. Then I, under fluoroscopic control, take my saw and make an initial cortical cut just for half a centimeter, let's say. And once you apply this one, due to uh, due to this cut, you cannot really move your saw anymore. Uh, to either direction. So then your cut is fixed and just runs like on rails all the way along on the fluoroscopic control on this 1K wire that you have shot and placed. And this is uh, what you reproduce on the other side. Well, so for the other K wire, it's the same technique. And then you cut out your, uh, you cut out your wedge and uh, remove it. And remember, you do this in the posterior three quarters of the femur. So the first cut has been made. Now this is the second cut, as you see, and you just do this in the posterior three quarters of the femur. And this is then the result of it after closure and plating. So there is very sophisticated tools, as we said, and Adrian pointed out that the throw of the saw blade is completely different if you use such a, a saw like the Striker Precision Saw. This is uh, uh, basically, uh, here you can see that I place my finger uh, to work as a retractor and you don't have to fear that actually gives you really great safety. Um, this is uh, a latest publication that we have uh, from a survival ship of Adrian Sirius actually um, being, uh, all these patients were operated in Basingstoke and uh, it's a 10 year survival rate of 89%. So almost 90% of these distal femoral osteotomies um, survive uh, the 10 year period. And uh, you can see that DFO for valgus alignment and lateral compartment arthritis uh, is associated with low complications, long-term joint preservation and uh, the preservation of uh, prevention of arthroplasty surgery. So in fact, I thank Adrian for, uh, for this tremendous work because it shows that uh, if you apply modern uh, and very sophisticated uh, indication, uh, have great tools, and um, put it all together, then you see results that really uh, that really compete with all other methods of uh, of knee surgery. And of course, if you can avoid to put in uh, total joints just by uh, joint um, preserving surgery, then you have to do that. So uh, this is the team from the London Osteotomy Center. Uh, Adrian has shown this. Um, slide already. I want to emphasize that uh, Ronald van Herwarden and Rekvir Kakar are part of the team uh, in London and we are happy to welcome you there uh, one day to, to present everything that we show you here in life. And uh, well, that was the end of the femoral surgery and the rest is then saved for, um, for the double level lecture. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Christian. That was uh, really nice. Great. So um, the first question that's coming up is that when should we do a medial closing wedge? When should we do a lateral opening wedge, distal femoral osteotomy? Very good. So um, obviously there is often uh, the question about le uh, leg length discrepancy. So yeah. um, you do a, normally you do an open wedge osteotomy when you say you want to lengthen um, uh, but remember that uh, you lengthen anyhow when you realign a malalignment to straight. If you go from, from crooked to straight, that lengthens everything already. So um, that would be a case where I say, when I have a massive discrepancy, more than two and a half, maybe three centimeters, I would say I, I go for an open wedge uh, osteotomy at the distal femur. If this is not the case, I tend not to perform open wedge distal femoral osteotomies because I hate actually uh, the lack of stability that they have. And uh, I don't like to put in, uh, in, in bone grafts inside. So my personal uh, um, approach would be in case there is no, just always remember that in case there is no massive uh, leg length discrepancy, my approach is always close the femur so if I want to correct a valgus, I make a medial closing wedge. If I want to correct the varus, I make a lateral closing wedge. 
and always approach the tibia from the menial side. So if you want to correct a varus, you make an open wedge HTO. And if you want to correct the valgus at the tibia, you make a closed wedge HTO. So that enables me to basically treat all my osteotomies with just two surgeries. The only question is from where you come and whether you open or close here at the tibia, it's just open yeah. or opening or closing. And for the femur, it's, it's always closing. Sometimes in occasional cases, of course, if there is left length discrepancy, you have to do that. Adrian. Yeah, I'm just going to say that on the tibia, in those very rare cases where we're doing intra-articular or we're doing, dealing with a, a previous um, um, issue in the tibia, then we would sometimes go to the lateral side and, and, uh, and do our lateral surgery. The other place for um, lateral approaches is when we do rotational osteotomy. So Absolutely. generally speaking, when we're doing a, a rotational osteotomy, uh, we make the, the incisions laterally for both. Uh, both the femur and the tibia, so that we um, we then make a, a cut in the um, mechanical axis of the limb, tibia and femur, and do our rotation. And we tend to do that on the lateral side of the tibia, but that's about it really. Yeah. So if you're faced with a situation where you have uh, uh, someone who's got recurrent patellar dislocation and also has got a valgus deformity, would you be able to do a concomitant uh, medial closing wedge with an MPFL? Or would that Once be again, I haven't, Sachin, Sachin, I, had a, I, I haven't heard that. Can you repeat your question, please? So if you have someone who's got a valgoid knee and has dislocation of her patella, then would it be possible to do put a plate pedially and do an MPFL? Or would it be better to do a lateral opening wedge and a medial MPFL? Well, absolutely. I would say I would say that's an ideal scenario because the uh, the medial uh, um, the medial DFO uh, the standard approach that you have is basically one of the only surgeries where you re really can see the MPFL because, as you know, the MPFL consists of two major strands, which is the uh, superior uh, oblique bundle and the inferior straight bundle. And the superior oblique bundle uh, lies directly close to the vastus medialis obliquus fibers. Because it's dynamized by it, this is why there is no isometricity for this ligament. So in fact, the inferior part where you lift up your, your uh, vastus uh, medialis is basically directly uh, in neighborhood to the, uh, to the superior oblique bundle of the uh, MPFL. So, Yes, is the answer. It makes sense to, to uh, reconstruct it if you go um, from the medial side. Okay. Your and plate then, basically sits north of that. Okay. So it's and not, then it's by, not by, in the way. By playing with, the, by playing with the, uh, the biplane, you can actually create 20 degrees of rotational change by either opening the biplane or closing the biplane, which is something that I learned from Bushen, actually. Okay. Um, uh, there's another question is that uh, after doing a distal femoral osteotomy, it is not uncommon that uh, you know there's a small step that stays. So when you close it, it's not point to point, but it's like mm -hmm. a small step, you know, something like this. So how do you prevent that? What's the technical tip to try and get over this? So um, for, for my technique... Uh, Christian, you, Christian you, it's so key. Why don't, you show, why don't you show the isosceles triangle slide one more time? Um, yeah, I can take a look at that. Yeah, you could do that. And uh, while he's pulling it up, Adrian, can you also elaborate uh, while he's getting that slide out? Adrian, can you answer this question? Is that, uh, can you use the same special retractor that you've demonstrated on the tibia on the femur as well? Well, we're going to develop it for the femur because we think locking retractors into the bone makes a lot of sense. So okay. uh, there's, there's, a, there's a whole family of, and they, I, I, we, we need to see whether we need to be sided. Uh, right and left, but they, they're going to be um, very um, cheap, disposable, uh, once only using retractors, I think. I think that's okay. the way they're going to go. Okay. Christian, are you able to get the slide up for the same? Mm, I should be able, actually. Wait a okay. second. Um, uh, here we it's go. Because such a key, I... it's such an absolutely key point. Yeah. Is, Do you mean is this fine. one? Do you mean this one? Yeah. Or the... yeah. 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 Okay. Wait. No, well, we'll go back, go back to showing that the, uh, the start of the isosceles triangle and also uh, if you can yeah if you can also specify that as to how much proximal from the joint line should you should you make your cut? 
So that's another question that's come up. So what should be the distance? Okay. So now, I, can you see my cursor? Yes, can you can see, see my cursor. cursor? Yes, okay, perfect. Can. So what what I describe here right now would approximately be the area where the condyle is on an X-ray. Okay. So this here. So in fact, uh, the hinge point directly sits on top of the femoral condyle. So if you want to say, you know, if you say you, you make a medial closing wedge, like in this case, yeah, perfect, who did that? I did it. <laughs> okay. Great. <laughs> all, the, all the sophisticated technique here, right? it's, it's a miracle. So let's say, I like this image actually, because that indicates that uh, you can even sometimes, if, if, it's, if this condyle is very close to the, to the cortex, it might be critical to place a proper hinge because th this is really a risk for uh, for hinge fracture and instability. So, if you place now this uh, this uh, hinge even a little lower, so within the within the condyle, um, then you uh, can uh, can can if, if you scratch away the the upper parts with a saw, it doesn't really play a big role. Um, I rather like to have it this way uh, and, and have a good stability than the other way around. So um, this is where the, the hinge has to be. And then you draw a line from there to your starting cortex. And there is endless lines that you could draw. You could draw one here, you could draw one there, but there is only one line which creates a rectangular shape to the tangential of the starting cortex in relation to this line that you that you orient to your hinge. So there is only one line that recreates rectangular surfaces. And this is the center of your osteotomy. So, so if you say you have- Yeah, so Krishna, if yeah. you can just stop for a second. So how do we actually find this line intraoperatively? So what's your trick? Do you pass a K-wire and see if it's yeah, perpendicular? Right. So can you- Right, I, I, take, I take a look at that. I take a look at that. This is the X-ray that you have. Forget about this, this triangle, yeah. which is now on. Huh? Yeah. So you just shoot a K-wire. Let's look from here. You just shoot a K-wire, put it inside. So if the, the K-wire that you shoot in has an upper angle in between this K-wire and the cortex, which is bigger than 90 degrees, then obviously it has to be it has to be the, uh, the uh, upper K-wire. If it's lower than 90 degrees, then it has to be the low K-wire, as you see here. Yeah. So this is how you can, can control your first K-wire. It has to be somewhat around 90 degrees. So if it's off completely, if you shoot a K-wire from here and you have like, I don't know, 130 degrees angle, uh, then obviously it's, it's, it's not the right starting point. So. Um, you need to be somewhere close to this area where the three sisters are. This is this anatomic shape, this curvature that you find here. Yep. Then you shoot your first K wire, and then you can see which one it is. Now, and the another question, uh, Christian, is, Christian, just just yeah. one one quick, quick quick tip there. Also, I think for 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 even fairly um, advanced femoral osteotomy surgeons, it's often quite a good idea to place the plate against the bone, to look at the contour of the plate. They're anatomically shaped and it gives you a very nice idea where you, you need to be to apply the plate at the end of the procedure such that it fits nicely and you've got this um, cut that is running down the middle of a, of a equilateral triangle. So uh, yeah, on, on the same thing, triangle. Yeah, on the same thing, if I can ask another very valid question that when you're correcting a varus knee, you know, if you've got a varus deformity and you're doing yeah. a tibial osteotomy, you're, you're doing the osteotomy on the medial side underneath the yes. affected compartment. You're releasing the MCL so that you can do that. But in a valgus knee, why don't we do the osteotomy on the lateral side where the compartment is affected and why do we do it on the medial side? So that's another uh, question that's come up. In a valgus knee for the tibia? In you mean the varus knee? height? No, no, we're talking about. So, in a varus knee, we're doing a medial yeah. open wedge tibial osteotomy. But in a yeah. valgus knee, why are we doing a medial closing wedge DFO instead of a lateral opening wedge DFO? Because yeah. the affected compartment is the lateral side. So, 
Yeah. Does obviously, it make sense? But what you, does yeah. it make sense to do the surgery <coughs> on the side that is affected? Is what the question is hinting towards. Well, let, let's be honest. If you, if I, if I make a medial closing wedge, I'm making the cut all the way through to the lateral side. So I don't think that the question is, do I treat the medial side by, or do I treat the lateral side by, by, uh, by making the cut starting from the medial side? In fact, you cut all the way through. What you change and what osteotomy is all about. Is is the mechanics. So the question is how to bring uh, the, the center of load to the medial side or out of the lateral affected compartment. So um, both surgeries, either a lateral opening wedge or a medial closing wedge uh, are not intra-articular treatments by themselves. What they do is they change the me mechanical alignment of the lower limb. So therefore, I guess uh, it's, it's not the question whether you treat from medial or lateral. It's just uh, the stability for the distal femoral osteotomy, which is so much higher when you perform a closing wedge osteotomy in comparison to an open wedge osteotomy. And apart from that, apart from that fact, uh, there is really issues with the IT bend in, in, in some of these cases. And if you apply a plate, then it's even worse. So even if um, we do but, a closing wedge on the lateral side, they always hate it. Yeah, okay. they get a bursa, they get so, friction on the plate. Yeah, so one more quick question before you move on to your next talk. I have so many questions that have come in. So as a general comment for both tibial as well as femoral osteotomies, what are the pros and cons of doing a uniplanar vis-a-vis a biplanar osteotomy? Adrian, do you want to? Yeah, so, well, the, 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 so let's, take the, let's take the tibia. Uh, it, it pretty much applies the same to the femur. When you make a biplane, you, your working length of your osteotomy, if this is the length of the tibia from the back to the front, the, the, the area that you need to heal up that you're opening is four fifths of the length of the tibia. So you only need a much, you need a much 20% less of the bone to actually functionally heal up. Then your biplane um, allows you to not worry about the patella tendon because you're coming, uh, even if you're heading straight for the, for the source of the patella tendon and tibial tubercle, for the insertion point, you're heading out underneath it. Um, and so you have very little chance of damaging the uh, extensor mechanism. You then have a flat surface at the front that Staubli has shown in three weeks on a tibia will heal with a CT study that he did. You get very rapid healing of the biplane. So the biplane gives you stability, rapid healing, allows you to position your osteotomy in a place where you don't need to worry about the trochlear on the femur and you don't need to worry about the uh, patella tendon on the tibia. And it means that your osteotomy, the working amount of bone that needs to fill in is 20% less by doing this very clever technique. Finally, it, uh, particularly on the femur stability, if you cut a femur right the way through, suddenly you've got this cylinder of bone that just drops with all the muscle and the weight of the knee. And, and we've all been in there with our big retractors uh, um, um, grabbing the bone and grasping it to get it to, to, to stay put. Um, with rotation, you, can, you have to go all the way through. You just have to be very careful. And if you are careful, you can do small angulate, angular changes and but often we see the bones start to move and it's something that we need to deal with. That's why we measure, we mark out the rotation before we make the final cut. This is not the case with a biplane. And this is an absolutely fundamental part of modern, modern osteotomy. Okay, thank there you. Is, thank there, is thank one, there is one last further thing for the femur, particularly, yeah. uh, you, have the pro, you have the patellofemoral joint. And uh, if you make a, a, a uniplanar osteotomy, you have to make sure that this, uh, is, is above the, uh, the, um, the trochlea, patellofemoral yeah. joint, above the trochlea. So if you perform a biplanar, you can be lower with the oblique osteotomy. So the overall osteotomy sits closer in the metaphyseal part where the healing is better. So okay. a, a monoplanar surgery goes rather into the area of the shaft where the healing is uh, compromised. So okay. this is another factor for, for choosing that, that height for the femur. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we'll move on to the last talk and then uh, I think uh, we'll still have to ask you guys to stay on because the barrage of questions coming in. We have uh, right now 4,900 surgeons uh, which are watching this live and I think uh, I get the message that there are more joining as well. 
So sure. Christian, uh, over to the last talk for today, which is double level osteotomy. I think that's a really interesting concept and uh, I'll get you to explain when and how we need this and what is the power of a double level osteotomy. Yeah, thanks, Sashin. So that's really remarkable. I mean, more than 4,000 colleagues uh, um, joining this uh, is, is really great to, to have this because uh, we, are all, we are all very um, interested. Not only we are ambitious about osteotomy, we want to get this going. And uh, it's really great to see that so many colleagues share our ideas and uh, have interest in osteotomy. So, um, well, it's quite easy. Now, as we had, uh, have heard about uh, HDO, and about distal femoral osteotomy, we have two, uh, two tools in our armamentorium. And in some of those cases, uh, it might make sense to use them both. Well, and I will now explain when this is the case. So this is the original thesis of uh, Johan Nikolic once again. And uh, if, you, if you take a look at this uh, paper, then uh, I would say even today, this hits uh, all the criteria of modern uh, publication and uh, it would really be uh, well accepted in any international journal, uh, even today. And uh, it's remarkable the, what kind of scientific level what was around 150 years ago. So unfortunately that's written in German, but you see that he made up all these measurements, beautiful uh, uh, tables that he created. And he measured everything uh, with a silk thread because X-ray was not invented back then. So he had to do all these measurements uh, with a silk thread and, um, and then describe this so-called directions or direction line, the Mikulic line. But as I said prior, he also described the joint line orientation and uh, described this with uh, the MLDFA, which he measured. Uh, even with the mean and standard deviation and everything. And he described in contrast to uh, Paley, he described the lateral proximal tibia ankle because he hypothesized that the overall limb axis is 180 degrees. And as the, um, the lateral distal femur angle is uh, 87, uh, the uh, alternating angle at the tibia is 93. So this is what he described then. So 150 years uh, later, we came to the same results actually. And this is what we still measure with. And this is what you have seen already. So I can just quickly go through because it tells you why uh, the joint line orientation has to be the way it has to be. Uh, actually, of course you can uh, change uh, the overall limb axis by just applying HDOs and, and changing the Mikulic line from medial to lateral or the other, other way around. But what you cannot do is you cannot affect the uh, joint line orientation by a tibial osteotomy. And this is very important to uh, get functional, uh, functional biomechanics. So in fact, uh, there was a guy called Tadahiko Kawai. He's an engineer from uh, Tokyo University. And he's one of the pioneers in uh, finite elemental analysis. And uh, to me, it seems not very surprising that it's rather engineers who come up with the idea of double level osteotomy and not surgeons, because if you look at these equations, they come up that complex and, uh, and weird that I most probably will never be able to understand that even if I go to university another decade. So, but there are uh, uh, engineers around and one of them is Surprisingly, this is what this is exactly the Mayo Clinic. Um, can you see now everything? Because there, okay, the internet connection is not stable. So anyhow, uh, uh, Edmund Chow worked in the Mayo Clinic that uh, Mikulic himself visited 150 years ago um, to just take a look at Horace and I forgot the name of his brother. Anyhow, the founders uh, Mayo Horace and and Grand uh, uh, Mayo, I guess. Um, and these founders of the Mayo Clinic hosted uh, Mikulic 150 years ago. So uh, what a tremendous journey this man uh, took on his shoulders just to uh, get to know all uh, the, the latest science that was around back then and how much easier it is for us now to just um, share a Zoom uh, conference and, and uh, get, get everything uh, delivered in your house. So anyhow, it was Edmond Chao who uh, worked as an engineer in the Mayo Clinic and he said, well, 
uh, if there is um, if there is now an, an option to transfer this uh, this uh, spring model that Tadaiko Kawai created for car engineering, actually, I can maybe transfer this um, uh, for bone surgery. And he created something like a rigid bone spring model. And he measured lots of forces around the knee joint um, and, and fed all this into a software program called OASIS. And that software program just was responsible then for calculating uh, based on, on the measurements that were uh, carried out, uh, what kind of load distribution makes sense when you apply an osteotomy. And obviously you have a chance now uh, to correct this uh, alignment, which is obviously far varus. Almost Mikulic line is almost not touching the border of the tibia, the medial border of the tibia anymore. So uh, this is 100% medial loading at 11 degrees of varus. And you could correct this now with a isolated tibial osteotomy um, and come to a 40% medial loading uh, at a five degree valgus, but with a nine degree lateral tilt from the joint line. So that would be one solution. And it does not really matter whether you perform a medial open or lateral closing tibial uh, osteotomy. The concept of a single level osteotomy is just wrong. So um, the answer that the OASIS program provided was a different one. And it suggested a double level osteotomy because the femur dictates the joint line orientation. And so you can distribute the overall um, amount of correction to split it up to some at the femur and some at the tibia and end up with the same orientation of the Mikulic line, but just with a 2.5 degree lateral tilt of the joint line. So in fact, this program was way smarter than most of the surgeons were based on the work of the engineers. But there was one surgeon at the Mayo Clinic uh, and it, he was, uh, that was uh, Georgios Babis, who is now working in Athens uh, and surprisingly not making lots of osteotomies anymore. But he said, well, if this software is that smart, then I just take these measurements from this software and apply it uh, and, and uh, tailor my surgeries to that. And uh, he did all these double level osteotomies suggested by the software and published a, a series um, uh, with the survival rate of 96% after seven years, uh, which is, Adrian, even a little bit better than your femoral publication we have just uh, received with just 90% after 10. But there is a gap of three years, of course, we have to admit. So that's remarkable figures. And there has to be some truth in the fact that not just the Mikulic line itself is of importance, but the joint line orientation. And as a rule of thumb, whenever you have a Mikulic line that does not touch the knee anymore, like in this chap here, then if you make a mono uh, or a single level uh, osteotomy and perform something like this, where you draw a virtual Mikulic line and open it up, um, then you come up with a correction that might end up at an NPTA, which is 100 degrees or more. And this is an, uh, a malalignment and a deformity in itself that you created heterogenically. So that cannot be right. And not all these deformities can be addressed at the tibia because the joint line needs to be taken into consideration. So this is a patient that uh, I planned for a life surgery, basically um, a tibial osteotomy. And uh, he had a tibial osteotomy at the contralateral side a couple of years ago. And luckily we retrospectively measured that. Uh, it was okay to treat him at the tibia. But for this surgery, particularly for this surgery, and you can take a look at the massive varus with a, uh, even with a, uh, with a, a thrusting and a triple uh, um, a varus deformity, um, you can see that these were uh, the, the measurements. So the analysis of the melanin came out with an MLDFA 92 degrees and an MPTA of 85. So the overall um, deformity was way more in the distal femur than in the proximal tibia. Thus, it was a varus, of course. Now, if you, if you treat this varus by a single level HDO, you end up with an MPTA of 100 degrees, as we said, and with a massive opening of some 20 millimeters. So obviously that creates something which is highly abnormal and rather has to be consider considered as palliative surgery. 
So you just are able to bring the Mikulic line to the desired area, but you're not able um, to fully reconstruct anatomy in terms of working biomechanic structures. So you have to go in these cases back to your drawing board. And this was the, uh, the correction that I then came up with, uh, seven degrees at the femur and six degrees at the tibia. So this is a little bit uh, something about uh, distal femoral osteotomy, why we skip from the traditional approach to uh, basically the rather minimally invasive one, but I've told you that before. And this is now the live surgery that we carried out and um, I just shortly get you through this because this is now from the lateral side. It's a little bit more difficult to get it done from lateral because you need to in a joy or in a, in a hockey curve stick um, uh, shaped um, incision, you need to bring back the IT band that you can suture back on later. And I still remember the question section on how to close this osteotomy properly at the uh, distal femur. We have not answered that. So this is now the biplanar cut that I perform. And I do this biplanar cut after I've made the oblique uh, incisions. So now every cut has been done and you now take out the wedge. So once you have the wedge out, you can close the osteotomy, but be very careful because that's brittle. And what I do is I close by repetitive introduction. Once again, maybe we can go back a little bit by repetitive introduction of the saw blade whilst closure. So the osteotomy has to be closed and I introduce the saw blade and from the hinge on, I remove it and, and, uh, and take it out slowly. Uh, and uh, this is how I sweep away all the remnants that potentially are inside and prevent me from closure um, uh, so that I don't break the hinge and can securely close it. And then you have really fitting cortical surfaces because you just have the millimeter thickness of the saw blade left and this is what you can compress. So that's another trick. I put in a little uh, um, passport cannula uh, in order to, um, to um, just have a little step incision and not uh, bring in all the, uh, all the towers for the drilling and, um, and, the, uh, um, and the screws and the torque limiter uh, individually. So I just establish a portal once and then I'm sure that the muscle is not too much compromised. So this is what Adrian has shown you already. That was before we changed our practice to go around uh, the posterior edge of the, uh, of the tibia. Uh, to release the, uh, the MCL. Uh, by now, I would say this video is outdated. I performed this in a different way. Back then, uh, as we were trained to perform this posterior cortex cut just by feel, uh, uh, without having any problems in more than 4,000 surgeries with that, um, uh, we found it was, it was okay for us, but anyhow, we have realized that most of our colleagues, of course, who step into the osteotomy world and want to perform these HTOs, they say, well, uh, how to protect the posterior structures? And we thought that there is need really for another teaching and uh, some novelties. And I guess now we really found a good solution for everyone who wants to do safe osteotomy uh, without uh, damage or without risk for the neurovascular bundle. So I guess we can skip that one. That's the result at the end of the surgery. And here you can see how the tibia remains aligned uh, with this construct. The wedge that we have uh, removed from the, or received from the femur basically was inserted into the tibia. You can see that. And that's a couple of months after the surgery. And you see that the thrust is even gone. So the patient really just walks straight and feels good with that knee and, um, and that all without uh, the obliquity of the joint line, which leads to uh, shear forces and therefore to possible rapid um, uh, destruction. So uh, as a summary, in some cases, uh, double level osteotomy makes sense. And in some cases, it's, cases it's, it's even the only option you have. Puristically seen, it's up to 10% of the cases. Um, uh, and uh, of course, you need to master the technique. So I strongly recommend you to start off with a tibial osteotomy, then you go for the femur. And once you master them both, you make double level osteotomies, use reliable implants. And as Adrian said already, this is has to be understood as a construct, as a working construct. You cannot just use any plate you want. Uh, this is condemned to fail or 
uh, you be uh, you be faced with higher failure rates, and this is something which is not acceptable. As there is brilliant uh, um, uh, tools around, so uh, rather use these, please, and start with single level, as I said. So that slide is already familiar for you. Thanks a lot. I guess we are done here with this talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christian, and thank you, Adrian. So we're going to open uh, the house for questions now. And uh, Sandeep Biraris has a question on the hinge. So Sandeep, do you want to shoot your questions? And then I have other questions to follow. Sure, sir. Uh, so I have a question for uh, all the faculties. Uh, like, uh, uh, have you noticed uh, any breakage of the hinge screw or any of the implant? That's the question number one. And when do you start full weight bearing? That's question two. Use of bone graft. Uh, any time and removal of the implants. Okay, so there are four questions coming here. So does the hinge screw break ever? Well, we haven't experienced a hinge screw breakage yet. I guess a screw itself is, is quite stable. And once, uh, well, I, I would rather say that the hinge around the screw breaks. So it's, uh, we haven't experienced that now. No, we haven't. Plate breakages, obviously, you can see that. So, but it's unlikely if you follow the characteristics of the plate. So, if you leave out screws just uh, on your own idea uh, and and you are not following the concept of these yeah. plates, then then uh, of course it's risky. You shall not do this. These these plates are all calculated. They are all tested under finite elemente analysis conditions. So it's quite unlikely to have that if you follow the complete concept. Okay, Adrian, a quick question to you. You're doing surgery and you see a hinge fracture. So how do you tackle uh, tachyotri one, two, and three if you notice it interoperatively? Yeah, so <clears throat> one, is, uh, one is almost universal. On a CT, if you look, you'll see a fracture in just about every single osteotomy that you do that extends out to the lateral cortex. Um, you know, obviously, we don't see these on the x-ray. Um, I, I think meticulous, careful surgery avoids the situation where you have an unstable hinge fracture, um, and uh, that is the absolute key. Now, if you do run into problems where you get displacement, um, uh, we've been working on some new tools, uh, which we, we, if we had time, we would share with you, where you can get indirect compression um, of the hinge in exactly this situation. And uh, that's a very nice little thing. Again, we've spent a bit of time with Nuclip. They've been very receptive and they have a lovely tool for that. And in fact, you saw as well, Sachin. So I think that's gonna be a good solution for that when we were presented with that. I think the, um, the type two is something that you very rarely see uh, intraoperatively. It's something that you see on your post-op X-ray. And when you see that, you just take the patients a little bit more quietly um, and you slow them down, you put them on crutches, and it doesn't tend to be a problem, but it is a source of uh, potential non-union. And I've had a couple of cases where I've actually used a bone stimulator um, just to make sure that you don't run into trouble, and I've never had a non-union there. Takuchi 3, I have seen on two or three occasions in my career, and this is just a, a light a fracture fixation for all of us. We see the step as the fracture goes up into the joint and we just um, put a clamp across the tibia. Uh, we reduce the tibia such that the fracture is reduced. Then we fix it with two cannulated screws, just as we would normally, just below the joint line. So that's how we deal with the uh, with the uh, unexpected Takuchi's. But I think if you follow the steps, if you do biplane surgery, um, if you're a bit just careful at the very end with how far you go with your saw, I think you can avoid these problems. Another key um, point to say is you must obviously cut under the wires when you're doing a tibial osteotomy because that minimizes the chance of a fracture going north towards the joint line because you're making your saw cut underneath your two wires that you've placed. Um, so that's another good little trick that, that uh, we didn't mention. Perfect. Okay, um, next question is that um, when in a tibial biplanar osteotomy, when do you take the tibial tubercle proximally? When do you take it distally? Christian, do you want to answer that? Well, once again, the, 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 you, the question was on the, as I understood it, this, on the distal tibial, versus, uh, dis, the distal versus, distal, yeah. distal okay, versus proximal. Got it. So, um, well, 
the, the concern here quite often is the patella height. So uh, the question is, obviously, if I make a biplaner uh, with an ascending cut, then I change the patella height if I lift that up. And if I do it uh, to the distal side, I don't change anything at all. So some there was some uh, ideas around uh, uh, standard wise uh, going for a distal cut. So the distal osteotomy has also some disadvantages. And um, if you make a distal cut, um, then you have the problem that the whole extension mechanism constantly works against this. And therefore it's potentially a little bit more unstable than the ascending cut. This is why it's recommended to, if you make a distal cut, fix it with uh, individual screws through this cut, like little fragment screws that you uh, point from A to P. So um, in my hands, uh, I'm not that concerned about uh, the patella height. If not, uh, at the starting level already, you have a massive patella baja. So if you have a Baja at the very start, I would say a distal uh, a biplanar would be okay. Um, but if you look at really the change of patella height um, and, and measure, uh, measure it up really carefully. And as you see, um, if I have openings of some 20 millimeters for isolated HTO, in most of the cases in my hands, this is a double level. So my average opening now is 10 mils. If you make a 10 millimeter opening, then at the level of the, if you look on the AP image at the level uh, of the uh, tibial tubercle, uh, which is rather to the lateral side, you may have an opening of four millimeters. So an overall change of the patella height at a 10 millimeter HTO might be four mils. In fact, it's even fewer than that because as Adrian already emphasized, the gap opening is trapezoidal. So in the back, it's higher than in the front. And where is the tibial tubercle? Well, it's quite far in the front. So I would say this is the narrowest part of opening. Yeah. So from these four millimeters that you open up in a 10 millimeter opening scenario, some three or two millimeters even just persist for the change of the patella height. And for the sake of stability, I would say it's justifiable to have a patella high change of two mils if it's not drastically uh, altered at the very at the very beginning of the surgery. So that would be my answer to okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the only other thing to say, the only other thing to add yeah. in is is existing patella femoral symptoms. Yeah. So the that patients is what I was have going got, to come to. Yeah. So yeah, if, you, got, if, some, if you have someone who's got uh, uh, patella femoral osteoarthritis, will you use the biplane effectively to try and compensate? For a bit of uh, symptoms coming from the patella femoral joint. Yeah, I think I, I think so, Sachin. I mean, I think certainly you wouldn't want to make it worse. These patients normally don't present with two um, sources of pain, anterior and medial. We're normally just treating the medial OA, um, and we see um, uh, evidence of arthritis of the patella femoral joint on the X-rays and the MRI scan. So we're being careful with those patients not to stir up the patella femoral joint. It's quite uncommon. Uh, again, except for in rotational osteotomy, to be messing around with the tibial tubercle to try and help the uh, patella femoral joint. It's more to avoid a problem. Okay. Uh, is the cl lateral close wedge tibial osteotomy a dead procedure? Uh, well, like I say, for rotation, it's the absolute workhorse. No, it's not something no, for, that people are doing. For a varus for, deformity, is it a... For osteoarthritis. Yeah. Well, it would depend. If you had um, scarred structures uh, medially, Ronald Van heerbaden has got a lovely case of a patient that was involved in a, in a polytrauma and they'd had flap surgery medially. Um, obviously, you would, you would never go anywhere near the medial side. In that case, you would use the virgin territory of the lateral side um, and you would carry out your osteotomy on the lateral side and, and do something uh, to the to the um, proximal fibula. Okay. Yeah, I would I would just add here, and yeah. you're absolutely right, Adrian. We're not here to persuade anyone from a working uh, practice. So if you do that, and this is your the way you do that, I mean, if if you osteotomize anyhow, that's I guess better than just putting in uh, total knee uh, replacements in all the patients that might not deserve one. So um, 
it's just what we present is just our way of adopting everything and and getting things done in a in the easiest way. So this is what we can suggest. But when okay. but when we dial when we dial back, Sachin, and we look at the lateral closing wedge, I saw Peter Myers doing this very expertly when I was with him in two thousand and four, yeah. and his anaesthetist had had both sides done. I mean, half the people in Brisbane seemed to have had an osteotomy under Peter, and he he loved that technique. But, uh, and it's a great technique, but um, the advantages of doing this to surgery on the medial side and not changing the configuration and the anatomy of the proximal tibia mean that when the patient comes round for hopefully, um, if they need another operation, a partial knee replacement or total knee replacement, you don't have this, this step that we used to see with the um, closing wedge osteotomy. So if we look at the, at the problems associated with the lateral closing wedge, um, common perineal nerve injury, particularly the branch to EHL. We've got the problem of uh, bone stock in that part of the tibia. We've got the issues of mobilizing the proximal tib fib joint, and we've got uh, potential compartment syndrome bleeding down into the anterior compartment, into the lateral compartment. And we've got this change in anatomy that we see after an osteotomy that makes the tibia look ugly and, and and potentially makes the total knee replacement difficult in the future if they okay. need, should they need it yeah so uh, we'll take three or four more questions because i think we're uh, sort of running over for over two hours now um the question is that uh, for a distal femoral osteotomy the when you take a lateral x-ray it appears that the distal fragment has is gone into extension but when you look at the limb the limb looks straight have you ever encountered that and uh, if so why does it happen and how can we prevent it? I have seen, once again, not understood fully because, uh, for the so tibia why, or for the femur? Why does the, why the, does the femur go into extension on the lateral and yeah, it doesn't for seem the to give a... That's a very, very good question, actually. I love, I love to hear that because um, the femur is, is a tricky one. It's really a brittle bone. And uh, what we do is, in all our cases, we support uh, the thigh and the back um, uh, when we do femoral osteotomies and we do it to an extent where we allow the femur at the level of knee to rest on it. And I want to have a little flexion and allow myself to lift up the, uh, the, the foot actually at the ankle joint. I lift up the foot a couple of, of degrees and then only I want to see my, my knee rising. So I want to have the knee positioned flat without any weight from the limp itself. Because if you perform the cut, then even with a K wire placed, such as a hinge wire in position, it might happen that the weight of the limp alone is enough to fracture your yeah. hinge. Well, if, if yeah. that's the case, you might end up in a scenario where you over, uh, where you over correct and end up in a, in a position uh, that you just don't like. So in these, this might be the case from an operative standpoint, yeah. from, from the idea that the limb is then later on just straight and uh, you don't feel or see a clinical problem. Well, some of these cases just have flexion contracture right from the start that you may have treated with that. That's good, obviously, but it's not good for the hinge. Okay, lovely. So, and I think uh, to all the attendees, I think if you want to see how this surgery is done, very eloquently and perfectly. I think you should join us on the 5th, 6th and 7th in Pune because Christian is going to be doing a couple of femoral osteotomies live and I don't think you want to miss out on the right steps. Okay, uh, the next question is the uh, essentially as to the amount of correction. So do all osteoarthritic virus knees, do they all need to be corrected to Fujisawa or would it be dependent upon the amount or degree of osteoarthritis, which is there in the knee joint, which will dictate our correction. So I'll get Adrian to answer that because I want you, Christian, to pull out your slide on joint line convergence angle because people are requesting that they've not quite understood JLCA. So I'm going to quickly ask you after Adrian answers sure. this question to go back and pull out your slides on JLCA. Okay. 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 I do that. Yeah. So, uh, so we, we follow the dogma when we first started doing osteotomies in our unit um, and we corrected to the lateral spine. And we did that because of Frank Noyes' great paper um, and because it was where the world corrected to 62% 
But then, of course, we started um, getting into osteotomy and we looked at the original papers from Fujisawa and we looked at what Fujisawa described. And actually, he described uh, his optimal position in his paper, which at the time was an amazing piece of work. He showed that he wanted to be roughly 30 to 40 percent in the lateral compartment, which actually made a Fujisawa position of 67.5 possession, uh, 67.5 percent. And Christian, if you've got the Fujisawa paper and you can screen share it, we can show even on the, you know, the, the post-operative x-ray that they showed in the, in the article, you see a very, very valgus correction that we wouldn't want to see today with modern osteotomy. Um, the Michelitz mm -hmm. line is roughly 80%. It's way too lateral. Um, so then we, we followed this dogma. And then, to be honest, um, Neil Thomas said, uh, Adrian, I just don't think there is enough evidence to say that we need to valgize knees I, uh, to, the, to the extent that we are. Why don't we aim for the midline? Why don't we aim to be 50 to 55%? And why don't we see how we get on? And we did that for um, over a decade now, and the results are very good. And slowly, everyone has jumped on that bandwagon. It's not terribly scientific, but what it does is it, it means that your active 44-year-old with a medial OA who's previously done his ACL, who you're doing your osteotomy to keep him active, you're not doing him out of a uni in the future. So by keeping him straight and getting the weight bearing line through the middle, you actually uh, can, uh, if you need to, do partial knee replacement surgery on these, on these uh, patients. Not that I have a huge experience of that because the survivorship has been so good. I have literally done a two or three or maybe two. Um, and so we now aim for the midline and we don't bespoke it according to, well, they're grade four medially. Why don't we go for 58%? There's a nice paper from um, from Munich, uh, uh, from um, Hinterwimmer, Hinterwimmer and Feucht uh, and Andreas Imhoff's team. And he showed how they bespoke it according to what they were doing, meniscal surgery, cartilage surgery, arthritis surgery. Um, but I just don't think that there is enough evidence at the moment. What we want to do is, and I'll tell you another really interesting thing, Sachin, is if you have the situation, which we do occasionally see where you undercorrect, quite often the patients are happy. So there's something about releasing the MCL and cutting the bone. And if we go back to the papers from Nottingham in the 60s, when they showed um, intraosseous pressures being decreased with, uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, sores, um, I think a lot of what we do comes from that soft tissue release and that bony cut. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm now sort of trying to, after these beautiful presentations that we made, saying that we, you know, it, it's all, um, it doesn't really matter where you go. I think it does. And the undercorrected patients, we had a series of 10 with one implant that didn't work out very well at all. Half the patients uh, lost correction within about eight weeks. And half of those patients were happy and half weren't. And we had to revise them. So we want to aim, I think, for 50 to 55%. Okay, fair answer. Uh, Christian, do you want to quickly re-explain in a brief about the JLCA? You, you asked you ask me to explain, re-explain the most complex topic uh, quickly. So uh, that's uh, first, I serve, first I serve <laughs> Adrian. Um, that's, the, that's the paper, the original paper from uh, Fujisawa. And as Adrian said, he never said go to 62% uh, uh, tibial plateau width. Uh, I don't know where this comes from. Actually, we, we have the, uh, the idea that it may come from the paper of Dachdale and Lewis, but anyhow, uh, Fujisawa said 30 to 40 percent of the lateral compartment, which is translated 65 to 70 percent tibial plateau width. And if you look at the post-operative imaging out of this publication, where it was corrected up to 70 percent, maybe you see a joint line obliquity, which is completely the other way around. So, um, and and that all that he was aware of uh, of Mikulic and the Mikulic uh, measurements. Actually, he cites Mikulic. Uh, with this, um, with this uh, uh, thesis paper from 1878, so uh, that's really great, a great masterpiece of uh, Fujisawa that he was aware of all this scientific stuff that was around. So now let's go back to the uh, Duckdale and Noyes paper, because they were the ones hypothesizing in this particular paper that I'm citing here that it might be better to go to uh, 62 to 66 percent. And this was then just found by empirical selection. 
So anyhow, now let's step into that because that's tricky. So we learned that there might be some malalignment in the femur or there might be some malalignment in the tibia if you individually measure it and analyze it. But it might also be at the level of the joint. Well, if it's a medial full thickness defect, like in this case, so to say, it might even be that there is no malalignment in the metaphysis of the femur and the tibia, and it's purely a medial joint problem, which then would possibly be applicable for unicondylar replacement. But anyhow, if this is not the case, and you say, well, he, this is a case where the patient has a torn ACL and it's rather posteromedial osteoarthritis than anteromedial osteoarthritis, this patient is someone for an osteotomy, or maybe it's age that gets you there. You have a joint line convergence angle, which is about to be corrected if you want to get the Mikulich line corrected to a certain point that you have chosen. But you don't know to which extent the joint will open up at the end and clean over after you corrected the mechanical problem. So now there is a way of finding out. And this way of finding out is either by uh, doing some x-rays like stress x-rays. So you get a certain idea of uh, to where it or how much it may, may change. But there is also a calculation based on an equation. And this equation was made by Duckdale and Noyes based on three quarters of the tibial plateau width. Um, uh, and um, basically it gives you at the end a correction constant. So the equation itself, I can share this with you, but this is very complex. Um, it's, uh, it's basically the radiance of, uh, of, um, of 180 degrees divided by, uh, by pi and that gets you to the 70, uh, 76 uh, correction constant. But let's not make it too complex. Let's just take a look at the, the knee itself and how it looks before and at the end of the surgery. So a normal joint line convergence uh, angle is two degrees, zero to two degrees, okay? So hypothesizing that if you correct it, uh, it will not be more than two degrees. So it will not clean to the other side, like being minus three, four, five, seven degrees, whatever. I say that there is an actual status you're in. In this case, you have a JLCA of eight degrees. So if you now correct and go over, follow my cursor in a, in a valgization correction, and so it opens up at the medial side. The question is now to where will it open up? So my hypothesis is it ends up at two and it's right now at eight. So the range in between is six degrees. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So will it react at all uh, or not at all? Or will it react completely all the eight degrees correct? Then it looks at the end like this. And if it does not correct at all, and it remains in a contracted situation, then it will stay at a joint line convergence of eight. But I have to apply this change to my correction, to my bony correction overall, because if I don't do this, and it may open up, then I end up at eight degrees of overcorrection. If it completely resolves within the joint and goes eight degrees or six degrees in this case, further to the lateral side, I've created an overcorrection. So I need to reduce my overall HTO by some degree. And now how, how many degrees are there that I have to reduce? Well, and, and there I just say, well, let's form a bell curve and say we start at two and uh, we start at eight and maybe possibly end up at two. This is the range of varia that you may enter for the correction. So, and this range is six degrees. So, and if you say, well, I don't know if I maybe under anticipated if I just take two till five or over anticipate if I say, well, it reacts completely five till eight. There is a middle in between, which is here five. And this is three from two and three from eight. So, and the range then is here somewhere in the middle, uh, identifying um, your standard deviation. So, and of course, now you can easily see that the value is three, 
but you can also calculate it just by looking at the joint line uh, convergence angle that you're measuring. So if you measure eight and you say, I may come to two, then you can def defy the range because two is a fixed uh, figure. It's the normal value. So you can defy the range by just uh, subtracting two from your actual measured joint line convergence angle. So in this case, eight minus two. And to find the middle of it here, the peak of the bell curve, you just div divide it by two. So it's JLCA minus two divided by two. And that brings you to three degrees of uh, consideration of correction. Perfect. I think uh, you've made it really quite simple. And uh, I think we'll probably call it a day here. We've been going on for over two and a half hours now. We started at seven. It's now close to 9.30 India time. I still have close to 278 uh, pending questions more. So that will probably <laughs> take you to your dinner time and our breakfast time. And a uh, lot of questions coming on slope correction. So slope correction, I think, is a completely uh, sort of, it's a huge topic in itself. And I'm going to sort of ask you guys to hold on. Once this finishes, I'm going to speak to Adrian and Christian again and see if they're happy to come back one more time to join us on another webinar, essentially looking at uh, slope corrections and how we can use them effectively in our practice. Of course, uh, we'll be discussing slope corrections very effectively in Pune Ni course as well. Um, I'm going to sign off here by thanking all the panelists. We're thanking Dr. Parag, who unfortunately had to leave for an emergency case. I thank Dr. Nilesh Kamath, Dr. Anshu Shekhar, Dr. Sandeep Biraris, and of course the master Dr. Ashok Sham, who helps us uh, completely by um, uh, ensuring that uh, everything absolutely stays perfect, though I messed up this time. We're going to invite you uh, next Saturday, where we're going to be looking at how we use the quad tendon graft in our uh, knee practice. How do we use it for ACLs, revision ACLs, PCLs, MPFLs. And we're very fortunate to have two good friends, uh, Christian Fink and Christian Hoser from Innsbruck join us for the same. So uh, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, thank you so much Pleasure. for being with us. Mm -hmm. I hope uh, we didn't bore you a lot with our questions. And I hope both of you will agree to come back again on another webinar on another Saturday evening for us, uh, Saturday afternoon for all of you to talk to us more. And maybe we can take slope corrections and rotational osteotomies uh, if all of you agree. And uh, over to Ashok for some concluding remarks before we say a final goodbye to all of you. Right. Uh, I think it was a privilege to listen to both of you speak. And I got many, many messages about the webinar and how excellent the quality was. So like uh, Tapasvi has said, we spent 150 quality minutes with both of you. It was amazing. And we had around 4,900 people with us uh, for this uh, whole, whole, whole 150 minutes. So thank you very much for, for this talks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you, Christian. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for giving thank us you. this opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Really amazing, Sachin. Thank you. Amazing.